Mr. Williams, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Okay. Hello? Yeah, there you, you go. Me? Okay, yeah. so say that. Yes. No, no, it's Demetrius. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? You can't hear me? Oh, uh, well, aren't you logged in to Zoom? Okay. Okay. Hold on a second. Uh, Zadok, your mic is is muted. Yes, yes, it is. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, aren't we supposed to be starting about now? <laughs> uh, yes, I'm actually. Up, oh, I hear this gentleman now. Hold on for one second. Let me mute up so I don't get too much feedback from my laptop. Okay. Okay, and I think I'm getting feedback too. So look guys, I'm not that technically savvy. So I've got a live stream going on YouTube. Is that like a delayed? Yeah, that's what's happening. YouTube is, is a delayed um, field. Um, let's see how I need to get over there. And um, because my activity is not being shown on YouTube yet. Um, so what I need to know is Okay, Zadok, you're in the room already, right? Okay. Okay, guys, I don't know. Those of you who are in the audience, if you can hear me, <laughs> I'm not really sure what's happening here because we're in three different platforms at the same time. And I think I'm getting some delay. 
uh, from the YouTube. Um, do do we supposed to be on another platform, uh, William? Uh, no, I mean you're good where you are because this is supposed to be broadcasting over YouTube. Okay. Um, okay. So it's um Okay, so uh brother Bell, um something funky is happening with the Clubhouse app where they went to actually start the room cuz they had pre-scheduled the room. So they just thought they were going to hit the button and start it in the room that they had open. They'll just tell everybody, "Hey, everybody come over to the room where we're having the the debate and something is going on with them so they, they they're asking for about five or ten minutes just to see if they can um um, um get the room started because they don't now they don't even see it the house something is uh malfunctioning and if they don't solve it then i'll just um i'll give them uh the option to um put it on my room just so because a lot of people on clubhouse aren't on youtube so i'll give them the option to let the audio um, be scheduled in my room and all those people could come near and listen while we uh, go live and get it started because the brother LV is the moderator and I do believe you do have um, you have someone who you've already chosen for a timekeeper, correct? Yeah, I have a timekeeper. One thing that I, that's happening oh, is... I'm sorry, hold on. I'm, I'm actually you hear me? not even on speaker now. There we go. What did you say, Brother Bell? Okay. I'm getting feedback from our... Um, from our um, YouTube feed. Really? And yeah. And I'm trying to figure out how not to do that. Uh, oh, wow. Because it's like, oh, I think what I need to do is turn my, let me turn my speaker down. All right. So if I turn my speaker down, I shouldn't be getting the feedback from that. All right. So let's, let me turn this back on and let's see what happens now. Uh, so maybe I won't be getting any feedback uh, at this point. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Sadar? Yes, I can hear you well. See, I, I can't even hear you now if I turn my speaker down. Really? Yeah. But you got, you got on headphones, Mr. Bell. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man.
Okay. Um, <clears throat> some difficulties here. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, those of you who are on YouTube, uh, can you hear anything? Are you able to hear now? If you can, give us a thumbs up. I can't hear anything. Are you getting that feedback too, Zadok? This mic is off. What about you, Demetrius? Are you hearing me at all? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I'm not getting any echo or anything out of Okay, Zadok must be uh, handling some things on his other channel. Um, yeah. I don't know how yeah, we're going to do this, because I'm getting delayed feedback from my channel. You know, after we say a few things, see, it's going on now. <laughs> oh, wow. And I don't know how to stop that. Uh, well, um now, now when you say your channel are you talking about youtube yeah see i i signed in um on youtube from my zoom you know i just did a uh, direct to youtube on the zoom and when i do this on facebook i don't have any problem i just turn down my speaker and i'm heard on facebook but i don't hear anything coming through here Oh, okay. Then are you able to mute? Like, that? does it actually show you your YouTube? Because you could possibly, you might be getting feedback because the audio is also yeah, coming. If I, if, I, if I mute the, if, see, all of this stuff is coming in. If I mute on YouTube, then they won't be able to hear. Oh, okay. I thought you were just muting. You can hear long, me on. Don't mute Zoom on YouTube. Like, if you can hear your own YouTube, if you just mute your YouTube, you won't hear you speaking through YouTube. But as long as your mic is open on Zoom, the, the audience is okay. fine. All right. So if I mute YouTube, will will other people be able to hear my YouTube? Uh yes, because your mic, because you're you're not speaking through YouTube. You're actually speaking through Zoom, correct? Yes. You have a Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that solved the problem. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, now see if you can hear me. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you, sir. Okay, I'm checking with someone who's listening on YouTube. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, all right, very good. Okay, all right, so so that was it, Zadok. Thank you very much. No problem. Now let me get to these guys, see if they got this thing fixed. Here yeah. now, some some people on YouTube say they are not hearing, but I have someone here who is actually hearing on YouTube. Yeah. It, well, if they can, if the person who's with you can hear through YouTube, then they can hear. Okay. All right. So we'll leave it at that. Maybe yeah, you maybe I need to scroll scroll down and see because uh, they could be hearing. All right. So now they hear. Yes, they're hearing. All right. Very good. Okay, so we got that problem worked out. You all just hold on a little bit, and uh, we're trying to get another issue straightened out on um, on the Clubhouse app. But you all should be able to hear us very well. We're just trying to get our moderators and everybody else uh, hooked in, trying to get hooked in on Clubhouse. Sorry about the delay. Okay, so a hey, brother Bell, they yes. actually have the room started. 
Um, okay. it's on the it's on uh, Creative Realities, um, room. They they just went to their other room instead of the Grand Rising because it just got crazy there. So people are right. starting to fill up uh, over there. Okay, I'm in. Yeah, I can hear it now. Uh, let's see. Hold on for a second. Because I can. No, I hey, hey, Mr. Bell, if I um, I'm not sure if you if you've been on Creative Realities, I can I can actually copy the link here and I can put it um, to your email. Well, I'm in there now. I'm in the room. What I need to do now. Oh, are you speaking? Uh, I can't. Oh, that's because my speaker is off. I'm sorry. I can hear you now. What'd you say, Mr. Bell? Yes, I'm in the room. I need to go ahead and join the stage. OK, good. Yeah. Very good, so, sir. So I'm on the stage. And um, the other thing I need to do is, um, well, that's going to come through on, um, it'll probably come through on the mic. So let me turn my mic off for the moment. Okay. All right. Yes, this is William Bell on here. I think Zadok will be, we'll both do affirmatives, but Zadok will be first since he challenged uh, me to the debate. Okay, let me um, let me see if I can get him in this room as well, uh, the creative realities room. Hold on a second. And you all are giving us like a two minute introduction before we actually get into our affirmatives, right? Okay, all right, all right. So give me a second. Uh, D Demetrius, Demetrius, if you can hear me, um, they're in the creative room. So can you go into the creative room so that uh, they will okay. be able to hear you as a timekeeper? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this and, and go there on Clubhouse. One second.
Okay, he's he's on the stage now. Well, he's in the room. His name is Demetrius. Um, you'll see him with the garden um, logo there. If you can get him up. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm William Bell, and I am a Christian minister. My website is allthingsfulfilled.com. I also have, uh, excuse me, let me do one thing. Um, I need to go back and hit a record, but I'm sorry about that. Okay, let me start that over. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is William Bell. I'm a Christian minister, and my website is allthingsfulfilled.com. I also have a YouTube channel, All Things Fulfill. I do a live TV broadcast every Saturday at uh, 6.30 p.m. Central Time uh, by the same title, and my website is allthingsfulfilled.com. I'm delighted to engage with Brother Zadok on the subject of the end times resurrection. I'm also grateful for many in allowing us to engage on his uh, platform. And of course, I know that there's been some change, but I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. I know there are technical difficulties that happen. Also want to thank the moderators, the timekeepers, uh, who will help to make this event possible and run smoothly. And lastly, I appreciate all of you uh, who will listen to the discussion with open minds, seeking to understand what each of us believes the Bible teaches on this subject. Brother Zadok and I both believe that the Bible teaches a resurrection of the dead, but our differences lie in the time of its occurrence, whether it is a past event finding its consummation in 70 AD or approximate time in the first century, or whether it is yet future to us today and is a material or uh, physical body uh, concept of resurrection. Uh, he can define whatever his uh, premise is and therefore not yet fulfill. And our second point of dispute is with the manner of the resurrection, meaning whether the resurrection is spiritual in nature and is focused on the deliverance of Israel out of sin death, and whether it focuses on, as I said, the raising of biological bodies from uh, the literal uh, dirt, uh, as I think he contends. I appeal to the audience to listen carefully, do your best, and may God in Christ be glorified by the truth. Thank you. Hey, salute, salute. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Hey, hey, salute to the Grand Rising family. I know that we had some difficulties. Appreciate those of you who've come over here. Salute to my Bible Dojo fam. Salute to my ABT Kings, you feel me? And I, I definitely appreciate Brother William Bell for uh, taking me up. Uh, when, when we had a discussion almost a couple of months ago now, I believe, back in May sometime, um, on this uh preterism uh narrative the full preterism narrative uh was a three-on-three -three, me trilla 
and uh, LaRon with him and uh, two other gentlemen. And I, in that debate, I said, I wouldn't mind having a debate with any one of them. And so William Bell did reach out some weeks ago and say, hey, I remember you saying you, you wouldn't mind debating one of us and I would like to take you up on that. So here we go. Salute to my man Rodney for allowing us to use the Creative Realities platform. That's my that's my guy right there. Appreciate him. And I'm just want to say one thing, y'all. Y'all already know who it is. It's your brother Crane Corn. Cause I'm running things. I'm running things. And today we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna show what is happening. As William Bell said, we do both affirm the resurrection, but we want to talk about the time narrative. I do know that um for our four preterist brethren, many of them put uh, 70 AD, basically everything in the scripture from the prophecies, even to the last thing you read in the book of Revelation, um, basically has all taken place. And so the resurrection of the just uh, would have already happened as well. And so I'm here to say that I don't I'm not uh, I'm not convinced from the Bible and from history that that is the case. And so this should be a well spirited debate for those of y'all who might want to check it out. On YouTube, uh, William Bell is streaming live over there as well. If you're not familiar with his platform, go and subscribe, please. And um, also check out my YouTube, The Bible Dojo. It's streaming on both of those platforms for your watching and listening pleasure. So um, I'm ready to get this in, man. Let's make it happen. Yeah, man. Guys have to support you. Guys have to I am. Let me hear what it sounds like, and then I'll know what to listen for. Who can you not hear? Testament writings, 
we do have something that starts to play out. And we have this part, the, the, the sign of the resurrection discussion, which has figurative connotation to it, but also has literal connotation to it. So first, I just want to briefly, by two or three witnesses, establish something that, from the old book to the new book, is something that you constantly see, but it is not told by any means theory of what it means when the Bible talks about the resurrection. So I'm going to start this off in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 30. Shab. Ezekiel 37, okay, and this will be familiar to probably everyone listening in. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 37, starting at verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Then he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy to the man, and say to the thus saith the Lord God, come from the four of his breath, and be the upon the slain, that they may live. So I found their side as a man, and the breath came into them and lived and stood up upon their feet and received the great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are tried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. So notice that he was in the spirit seeing this. This is a vision. And when he sees this resurrection, of these calcium white exceedingly dry bones that are now alive with the spirit in them, Yah is interpreting that this vision is allegorical of the current state of the nation at that time. Ezekiel, of course, was a part of the uh, 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 the first wave of the uh, Judean captivity to Babylon. And of course, the, uh, the uh, 10 tribes had been put out about a century earlier. So the whole house of Israel says, Basically, our bones, our bones are dry and our home is lost. But look at this. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus saith God, Elohim, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. You shall put my spirit in you. You shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe that this uh, was fulfilled when the children of Israel came back after 70 years. As a matter of fact, after this statement, it's probably about 80 years. So this is an idea of how you can see the language of... Um, this is how you can see the language of resurrection being spoken of in the prophets, but it's clear that it's allegory, right? Now check this out. Let's go over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Because now myself and Brother Bell, continuing to be in the prophets, we have something here that we're going to see. And I believe he and I both would, we would take this and we would make this thing that Isaiah is being shown and that he's speaking to the nation. We would uh, equate this with the coming of who they call Jesus the Christ. So I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'm going to go down here. It says this, this is uh, Isaiah 53. And verse eight, he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and he have put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge 
shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, for those of us who are Christians, we would actually use this and point to the death, burial, and resurrection. Christ given his body and his life as in, in his soul as an offering for sin, and then the resurrection on the back end, allowing him to prolong his days and see what the travail of, of his soul and his um, giving of himself led to. Now, you see here in one prophet, we can see some allegorical narrative through a vision. And then here through another prophet, we're actually reading something that we believe is not allegory and that it literally was talking about suffering, death, burial, and literal resurrection of the man. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two, the book of Ephesians chapter two. And when we get there, verse one, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Skipping down to verse five. Even when we were dead in sins, have que he hath quickened us together with Christ. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages, the aeons to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So brethren, we have a couple of things here. When you go to Colossians 2, y'all know there it talks about us being buried with him in baptism and we're also risen with him through faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. We know that that was talking presently and that that wasn't like talking about 70 AD. When he was writing the letter, he's telling the church that through baptism, the church is buried with Christ and quicken it or quote unquote made alive. So of course we see that, but then we also see, let's go back to the prophets. We see this, let's go to the book of Job chapter 14. Let's go to Job 14 because I don't have to go and show uh, in the gospels that Jesus literally died and resurrected according to the scriptures it constantly says, as it was written according to the scriptures that he would die and be raised again to life. So we see if the scriptures talked about a literal resurrection, and we also see that the scriptures talked about a resurrection from the deadness of sins, we can substantiate both. We're just going to have to show that as we come to the end of the covenant age of Israel, if everything was finished or if there was more to happen according to the prophets and according to the words of Jesus and the apostles. So in the book of Job chapter 14, that's where I want to go. Uh, which one? Okay, here we go. Verse five, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn for him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as in hireling his day. For there is the hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. Now we know in this narrative, Job, who is under the impression he could possibly die at any minute, this book starts with his, his good friends, quote unquote, coming to him, seeing that his condition and got so bad he could possibly die. And here Job is speaking of the hope and through this whole scripture, his spirit is not going out of him. He's just trying to figure out why is he near death after all he believes he has done according to the will of God for a righteous man. Yet through the sin of water, it will bud and bring forth vows like a plant. But man dies and wastes away. Yeah, man, give up the ghost. And where is he? As the waters fell from the sea and the flood decays and dries up. So man lies down and rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. And it's so interesting that the new heaven and new earth narrative of the book of Revelation talks about this heaven and earth being passed away and something new being established. And now there comes this judgment where, where all will be awakened. And in this same book, when you go over to chapter 19, it says this. This is good. Look at what Job says. So as he contemplates and has this conversation with his friends, 
This is what he says out of his own mouth. This is chapter 19 going down to around verse, here we go, uh, 25. For I know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Zechariah 14 establishes this. Other texts establishes this. Uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the dwelling place of God coming from heaven to the earth and dwelling with men and they shall be his people and he be their God. He says, I know my redeemer lives and will stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So he's saying that his body is going to be given to him again, even after it's been destroyed. He said, after worms have eaten his body, yet in my flesh will I see God, whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another. Though my reins be consumed within me, your reins is your strength, your organs, your life force. Even after all of that goes, I know in the latter day, when my Redeemer stands upon earth, even after my body gone, I'm going to be brought back because I'm going to see him. And notice what he said. I will see him for myself and my eyes will behold him and not another. No one is this isn't allegory. Somebody else going to see him on my behalf. No, my eyes will be given to me. So I myself can behold the most high God. Also. I'm going to go over to, um, let me, let, let, let me stick here in the prophets. Let's go to Isaiah 63. In the book of Isaiah chapter 63, I'm going to skip down here for the sake of time and not read as much as I thought, but look at this verse 15, look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength and the sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art, out, thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Now, the writer here is saying, God, Israel, the nation belongs to you. And even though Abraham, who is our forefather, is ignorant of us and Jacob doesn't acknowledge us, that's because they're in their graves sleeping dead and they don't know nothing. Y'all know all that stuff Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. They don't know us. They've never met us. They're dead. But you, oh God, you are our father and our redeemer. And so they're asking for God to save them because their righteous forefathers can't who are dead. But look at what Yeshua says out of his mouth. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter eight. In the book of Matthew chapter eight, Yeshua says something pretty interesting here. Let's heat it up a little bit. Matthew chapter eight, starting here at verse 10. Yeshua says, uh, it says, when Jesus heard it, he marveled. When he heard the, 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 uh, this centurion soldier who had this great faith of Yeshua healing his, uh, 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 his ailing uh, family member, Yeshua says, uh, verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeshua is establishing here that in the resurrection, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who will be resurrected into the kingdom of heaven, that many non-Israelites will come from various places of the earth to be allowed in that kingdom to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Abraham's flesh and blood descendants some of them are going to find themselves not worthy to sit down with their own forefathers. And the writer of Isaiah told you, Israel, no, that Abraham and Israel are literally forefathers of theirs, right? But check this out. Let's go to John chapter six and let's look at something that Yeshua says out of his own mouth. Once again, did you hear the plane landing? No, I did not hear the plane landing, but that is fine. I can continue that in my next uh, part of the presentation. All right. Uh, I'm sorry about that. No problem. I, I thought I, I, I shared the plane. You probably did, yeah, good brother. I, and, and, and I was ignoring it. That's possible. But thank you. I'll end there. William Bell, so you, brother. Okay. Would you give me just a moment to make sure that people on uh, YouTube are hearing? They, for a minute, couldn't. Could, Yes, I am here. Give me just a moment to make sure that the people on YouTube are hearing. They couldn't hear 
um, earlier, but I think they're okay now. They said they can hear. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, let me know when my time starts and then I'll be ready. Okay, all right, thank you, Brother Zadok. I am affirming that all end times events, including the resurrection of the dead were prophesied to occur within the last days of Israel's national kingdom. Since we are debating the resurrection, it is necessary to identify the period in scripture called the last days. And an understanding of this will help us to understand the place, time, and manner of the resurrection. Brother Zadok and I are arguing for two diametrically opposed premises and concepts. He's arguing for a physical resurrection of bodies from the ground uh, to occur in the future, a time far beyond the biblical period of the last days. I'm arguing for a resurrection out of sin, death, captivity, and bondage, spiritual in nature relating to the restoration of God and awakening man to righteousness or life in Christ through grace, mercy, and redemption. And secondly, I'm arguing that this resurrection um, primarily included the Old Testament saints from creation up to those of the last days of the New Testament era consummated in 70 AD. Now, what is the biblical period of the last days? The last days is the period of Israel's history that marked the close of her national covenant relationship. In Genesis 49, 1 and 2, Jacob calls his sons to tell them what will happen to them in the last days. Uh, that's 49, 1 and 2. Thus, the last days primarily were related to the children of Israel. Balak told, uh, Balaam told Balak to come and he would show him what his, uh, this people, Israel, would do to your people in the last days. It is in the last days when Moses said the scepter and his kingdom would be at hand. He said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. At least Moses, Moses recorded that, Numbers 24. In Deuteronomy, Moses spoke of the events that were to occur in the last days, saying that the nation would become utterly corrupt and destroyed. He spoke of the crooked and perverse nation in Isaiah, excuse me, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 20, the end of heaven and earth, verse 22, the time of God's vengeance, verse 35, 41, and 43, the judgment, wrath, and atonement for the land, and the coming end of the Gentiles. All these events would occur in the last days of Israel's national kingdom. Hosea spoke of the resurrection of Israel in the last days when Judah and Israel would be gathered together. Hosea 1, 10, uh, verses 9 through 11, chapter 3, verse 5. And also Paul cites these texts in Romans 9, 24 and 25. Peter does in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, and says it was in the last days, 1 Peter 1, 5, and also verse 20. To further identify the last days, there are several events which were prophesied to occur, all of which events occurred in the first century. First, the promised Messiah from Genesis 49 and verse 10. Uh, we've already mentioned Numbers 24 and uh, with the scepter and then also galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 the bible says but when the fullness of the time was come god sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says god spoke to his prophets but in the last days has spoken to us by his son and that was christ uh, according to hebrews 1 and also chapter 2 and verse 3 daniel prophesied that israel's last days would consummate in the end of the levitical sacrificial system the destruction of the city and the temple all within the 70 weeks of daniel he said, 70 weeks are determined for your people. That is the end of national Israel, their Levitical kingdom. Matthew 21, 33 through 43 says the kingdom would be taken from them and given to another nation, bringing forth fruits. And Galatians 4, 30 talks about casting out the bun woman and her son, which was old covenant Jerusalem. And uh, he says also for your holy city, that would be the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, according to Matthew 24. Mark 13, Luke 21, also Revelation 18 and 19. It was also to finish the transgression, which Jesus mentioned was the filling up of the cup of their iniquity, according to Matthew chapter 23, verse 32 through 37, also 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16 by Paul, saying the wrath had come upon them for murdering the Christ and persecuting them, as well as Revelation 17, full with the, uh, 17, 4 through 6, with the woman full of a cup, a cup full of abominations. It was also to make an end of sins. Now, this is what I'm saying is the resurrection of the dead. And that is according to um, Acts 17, 30, 31, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Thessalonians 4, and other texts that we'll get into later. To make reconciliation for iniquity. That is the atonement for sin that is typified in the uh, Levitical priesthood in Hebrews chapters 9, one, verses 1 through 27. Also, in verse 28, when Christ would appear a second time apart from sin for salvation, it was to bring in everlasting righteousness. That is the new heavens and the new earth of 2 Peter 3, where he says that uh, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. 
So that means the old heaven and earth, the ministration of death, where sin and death reigned, according to Romans 5, 14, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, 2 Peter uh, 3, 12, was, as we mentioned, had passed away, and the new heavens and earth arrived uh, in the consummation in 70 AD. It was also to seal up vision and prophecy. In other words, to bring an end to the office of the prophet, as well as to fill or uh, fulfill all uh, vision and prophecy, according to Matthew 5, 18, and also Luke 21, 22, when he says, these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written would be fulfilled. And then to anoint the most holy, which uh, in this case would be the heavenly or the uh, holy places not made with hands, according to Hebrews 9, 24, through um, uh, the end of that chapter, but particularly also uh, Christ, who is, and, and the Father, who are the temple, according to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22. We also have the establishment of the kingdom in the last days, according to Daniel 2, 44 and 45, Isaiah 2 and 2, and Mark 1, 14 and 15, when Jesus said, when after John had been cast into prison, he said, the time is fulfilled. That was the appointed time of Daniel's prophecy, saying that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, repent and believe the gospel. The coming of, the, of Elijah was to happen before the great and awesome day of the Lord, which Jesus also affirmed, according to Malachi 3 and 4, that it was John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 17, verses 11 through 13, and Luke 1, 16 and 17. The outpouring of the Spirit, according to Joel 2, 28 through 32, Acts 2, 16 through 20, that would uh, take place until the great and awesome day of the Lord, which in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verses 7 and 8, he says they would be confirmed to the end that they would be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, showing that those miraculous gifts would continue until the time of the end. And again, that was 70 AD. Micah had prophesied in Micah 7 and verse 15 that according to the days of Israel's coming out of Egypt, he would show these wonders and signs. Well, that was a period of 40 years. You can also see it in Acts chapter 7 and verse 36. The eschatological coming of Christ, the judgment, the resurrection, the appearing or the epiphania, the manifestation of a hidden divinity, and uh, of Christ and his kingdom are constituent elements of the end times. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul said, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom, at his appearing and his kingdom. So he was about to judge. He used the word mellow for, em for eminence there. So in order for Zadok to establish his proposition, he has to properly locate the last days, which I challenge him to do in this debate, and the last days from the Hebrew accurate and the Greek eschatos simply means the end or the final or extremity of the days of Israel that Jacob talked about in Genesis 49, 1 and 2. The last days began before what we call the beginning of the Christian church. John the Baptist came in the last days around 26 AD during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Luke 3, 1. Jesus spoke in the last days from 26 to 29 AD, roughly, and both before uh, the church, both died before the church began on Pentecost in the end of the age, but not at the very end of it, according to Hebrews 9, 26, because Christ appeared in the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Therefore, the age or period in which both John and Jesus lived was called the last days. That means the last days was a period of about the last 40 years of Israel's national history. Their national history began with 40 years of special miracles in Egypt under Moses and, and during the wilderness wanderings, and it ended with 40 years of special miracles under the apostles, uh, concluding in the fall of the temple and the city in 70 AD. Now, it is within the last 40 years of the Old Testament that all end times events occur. According to Matthew 24, 3 and verse 34, all these things fulfilled in this generation, Luke 21, 22 and 32. And again, that's Daniel 9, 24, as well as um, uh, Luke 21, 32. So that's the time frame for all eschatological events, the judgment, the resurrection, the appearing of Christ and the kingdom, et cetera. Secondly, this time did not occur under the law or the prophets up to the time of John. Why? Because the text says, for all the law and the prophets prophesied until John, but since or after that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. That's when they began to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. That's when they marked the period of the last days. Uh, and that is also Colossians 1.13, where they were in the kingdom, translated out of the power of darkness. And again, in Revelation 1.9, where John says he was in the kingdom and the patients. Now, Peter said the prophets spoke of events not in their time, but in the days which the apostles lived, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. So here's the argument. 
the last days were already running their course during the ministries of John and Jesus, and therefore had to be in the last days of the age or the covenant and time in which they live. That cannot be the end of the Christian age because the Christian age has no end, Luke 1, 32 and 33, Ephesians 3 and 21, and it had not yet begun, but the end of the age of Moses. Therefore, the time of the resurrection belongs to the end of the age of Moses, that is the end of all things that was at hand. That is the resurrection and judgment that Paul said was the last hour in Romans 13, 11 and 12, and was about to occur, Acts 17, 30 and 31, also chapter 24 and uh, verse 14, 15 and 24. So Zadok must prove that the last days began at a time later than the days of John and Jesus, and then tell us how both John and Jesus who died before that, uh, that time were in the last days. Why Peter said that all the prophets from Moses, Samuel, and those who followed after them, Acts chapter 3, 24 and following, had foretold of these days, meaning in their generation, as he told them to save themselves, Acts 2, 40, from this perverse and crooked generation. They couldn't save themselves from a generation they didn't live in before them. They couldn't save themselves from a generation that has never yet come. It had to be the generation in which they were then living. And why the fall of the temple, the destruction of the city, the end of animal sacrifices and the Levitical priesthood were not the end of national Israel when their whole covenant was built upon the priesthood, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. Yet God took the kingdom from them and gave it to another nation, Matthew 21, 40, uh, 33 through 43. Now, what is the nature of the resurrection? Again, when I speak of the nature of the resurrection, I speak of resurrection from Adamic death or separation from God, which he experienced the day he ate of the forbidden fruit. God told him, in the day you eat, you will die. It's the same day Adam and Eve's eyes were opened. Romans 5, 12 through 14 says that the death uh, or sin entered the world by one man and death by sin. It also says that death reigned from Adam to Moses. It doesn't say it reigns after Moses, but from Adam to Moses, but it also calls that death condemnation. Romans 5, 16, verse 17, verse 19. It does not call it physical death. If physical death is condemnation, then everyone who physically died was condemned, and all who will physically die are condemned, and if not, why not? But Paul also said that death caused by sin only reigned, as we said, from Adam to Moses, that is, to the end of Moses' covenant. Then he said that the law entered, that is, Torah, that the offense of Adam might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So the remedy for sin that caused the death of Adam is not resurrection from physical death, but it's grace, mercy, and forgiveness of sin. So that as sin reigned in death, even so might grace reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The resurrection is the result of the high priestly work of Christ atoning for sin. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. Paul introduced 1 Corinthians 15 with a quote from Hosea chapter 6. He said, Ephraim, the northern tribes, were sick because of sin. God chastised them, sent them into the graves of Assyrian captivity, much like uh, Zadok is already described with the Babylonian captivity. He would return from his place uh, uh, to his place until they acknowledged their sin, confessed and repented, and afterward they would seek him when they were in affliction and captivity. They were dead in those uh, metaphorical graves of Assyrian captivity. In chapter six, oh man, this is really tough. In chapter six, one through three, he, he told them to repent. And so they said, uh, let us return to the Lord for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. They weren't buried in little, uh, in little graves. Now, Paul takes that motif from Hosea 6 and quotes it in 1 Corinthians 15 and says that Christ died for Israel's sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day. That's an elliptical phrase, and it means he rose for their sins, Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he rose for their justification. Christ is the new Israel, the first one to rise to receive the promise of resurrection. He is the true seed of Abraham, Galatians 3, 16. And all who want to be Israel or the seed of Abraham have to come through Christ. Why? Because he said, I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25 and 26. So the context of Hosea is resurrection out of sin death. And that is what Paul used for his motif in 1 Corinthians 15, saying Christ died for our sins. Lastly, Paul ends 1 Corinthians 15 with another quote from Hosea 13 and 14 to speak of sin death. Israel died worshiping Baal. They sinned more and more. They were carried off into the graves of Assyrian captivity. And God said their uh, idolatry and, and um, uh, holotry, 
uh, was bound up in their iniquity. Their sin was stored up. They would go through the travail of birth pangs. And he said, I will redeem them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be your plagues. O oh, graves, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. Paul quotes that at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, says, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, or grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The lack, uh, excuse me, the lack of breath or the lack of a pulse or a heartbeat is not uh, it, uh, is not what he's talking about. It's not a physical dead body, but it's sin. The strength of sin is Torah or the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's my time. Thank you. Uh, hold on, this this 10 minutes, correct? Yep. All right. Let me set the time real quick. All right. All right, Zadok, I'm ready for you. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, here we go. So, hey, that was interesting. You know what's so funny about that, that, that text I showed in Ezekiel? We can literally point to the people being resurrected from the dead spiritually and being brought back to their land. It's kind of interesting that Yeshua actually prophesied to Jerusalem and told them that they would be in captivity, that Jerusalem was going to be left desolate and they would be put in captivity into all nations until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now that happens at 70. So there's something that continues past 70 and the times of the Gentiles doesn't end with 70 AD. The children of Judah being put out of Jerusalem happens at 70 AD. And they're gonna be in captivity until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And of course, if we were, if this was another discussion, we could go into the prophets and show the things that are supposed to come to Israel after that prophesied captivity that Yeshua actually spoke on them when he told them their house was left to them desolate. But you know what we're going to do? I'm going to turn around a little bit. I'm, I'm going to turn this around a little bit. I'm going to take this time to go into history. I, the, some of the things he said that I have to prove, I, I'll prove those things when he asks me questions. I'm going to continue presenting some undeniable facts to the room. So, hey, brethren, check this out. I want to take you all to a couple of sources. I have all of these sources, literally. And I just want you to see something here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish something today because now, of course, because of course we have the scripture and in my rebuttal rounds, I'll get into some of the scripture more, but we also have history. We have those who were disciples of the apostles. And then we have those who were disciples of the disciples of the apostles. And the, and John and revelation in particular, I just want to put something out there about what I accept as the time that John actually did this work. Right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. When we actually go here, I'm going to go to, who am I going to go to? Actually, let's go to what Eusebius said um, in book three, chapter 17 of his ecclesiastical history. Uh, Eusebius writes this, Domitian, having shown great cruelty toward many and having unjustly put to death no small number of well-born and notable men at Rome, having uh, 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 caused uh, exile and confiscated the property of a great many of uh, illustrious men, finally became a successor of Nero in his hatred and enmity toward God. He was, in fact, the second that stirred up a persecution against us, although his father Vespasian had undertaken nothing prejudicial against us. So they're letting you know how uh, 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 um, Domitian, Emperor Domitian of Rome, had actually did what his father didn't do. And Eusebius actually says this further in uh, chapter 18, book 3 of his, his uh, Apologia called Church History, he says this further. It is said that in this persecution, the apostle and evangelist John, who was still alive, was condemned to dwell on the island of Patmos in consequence of his testimony of the divine word. He says Irenaeus in the fifth book of his work. Now, Irenaeus is the student of one of John's main students. Uh, he says where he discusses the number of the name of the Antichrist, which is given in the so-called Apocalypse of John, speaks as follows concerning him. If it were necessary for his name to be proclaimed openly at the present time, it would have been declared by him who saw the revelation. For it was seen not long ago, but almost in our own generation, at the end of the reign of Domitian. Tertullian actually writes in chapter five of uh, his Apologia, he says Domitian too was a man of Nero's type and cruelty, and uh, uh, he tried us at his hand, but as he had something of the human in him, he soon put an end to what he had begun. 
even restoring those who he had banished. And so now they're claiming that John was let off the island by Domitian. Hippolyte, excuse me, Hippolytus actually writes in uh, chapter one of his uh, writing called the 12 apostles. He says, John again in Asia was banished by Domitian the king to the island of Patmos in which also he wrote his gospel and saw the apocalyptic vision. And in Trajan's time, he fell asleep at Ephesus where his remains were sought for but could not be found. And then Victor and then Victorinus uh, in the 10th chapter of his commentary on the apocalypse of the blessed John. So he got a whole commentary dedicated to the writer of the book of Revelation. He said, when John said these things, he was in the island of Patmos, condemned there to the labor of the mines by Caesar Domitian. So I'm going to argue that he was, that the book of Revelation was given in the 90s. Some, some Christians, like probably our preterist brethren, would try to argue before 70 AD. But then let's actually see what Jerome said. Jerome said in the 14th year, then after Nero, Domitian having raised the second persecution, he was banished to the island of Patmos and wrote the apocalypse on which Just, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus afterward wrote commentary. So we do see it's common that some of the early Christians believe that the book of Revelation, that John was given that vision in Patmos. And when he uh, in the mid, when he in, in the uh, early 90s uh, got off the island, and went to Ephesus and became bishop. There he penned the revelation and this, that, and the third. Hey, I wasn't there, so whoever accepts that, not. Nah. But why do I do that? Because now I want to take you to a couple of students of the early church, at least within that first century, starting at John's direct student, and then moving forward with what they thought about the resurrection of the dead. Did they think it had already come to pass and everything was finished in the year 70? Of course not. So I'm a quote, and I have all of these. Um, I'm going to quote out of Polycop of Smyrna, letter to the Philippians, chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, uh, whoever perverts the sayings of the Lord for his own desires and says that there is neither resurrection nor judgment, such a one is the firstborn of Satan. Let us, therefore, leave the foolishness and the false teaching of the crowd and turn back to the word which was delivered us in the beginning. But how about this? Let's go to actually, let, let's go to Clement. And then Clint, Clement writes uh, around 180 AD or so uh, in the letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 24. He says, let us consider, beloved, how the master is continually proven to us that there will be a future resurrection of which he has made the Lord Jesus Christ the firstling by raising him from the dead. Let us look, beloved, at the resurrection which is taking place seasonally. So you see how they talk about the seasonal resurrection, which Wim Bell is going to do all day. I'm the one who said it all first. You know, Paul said, I die daily. So there's this constant uh, 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 healing of the old man and his desires and walking in the newness of life. But notice how they understood that, but didn't dismiss the future literal resurrection of the dead. So look at this. Day and night make known the resurrection to us. The night sleeps, the day arises. Consider the plants that grow. How in what manner does the sowing take place? The sower goes forth and casts the seeds on the ground. They fall to the ground, parched and bare where they decay. Then from their decay, the greatness of the master's providence raises them up. And from the one grain, more grow and bring forth fruit. But how about this? I'm going to go to his uh, 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 to the second apology of Clement. And in chapter nine, he says, let none of you say that this flesh is not judged and does not rise again. Just think, in what state were you saved and in what state did you recover your spiritual sight, if not in the flesh? In the same manner as you were called in the flesh, so shall you come again in the flesh. If Christ the Lord who saved us, though he was originally the spirit, became flesh and in this state called us, so also shall we receive our award in the flesh. Why did they think there was a literal raising of the flesh and blood body still to come? Justin Martyr, first apology of uh, 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 chapter 52. The prophets have proclaimed his two comings. One indeed, which has already taken place, was that of a dishonored and suffering man. The second will take place. Now, Justin Martin writing this damn in 150. The second will take place when, in accord with the prophecy, he shall come from the heavens in glory and his angelic host, when he shall raise the bodies of all the men who ever lived. Then will he clothe the worthy in immortality, but the wicked clothed in eternal sensibility. He will commit it to the eternal fire with the young evil demons. But how about this? 
uh, uh, in his book called The Resurrection, in chapter 8, it says this, indeed, God calls even the body to resurrection and promises it eternal life. When uh, the promises save a man, he thereby makes his promise to the flesh. What is man but a rational living being composed of soul and body? Is the soul by itself a man? No. It is but the soul of a man. Can the body be called a man? No. It can be called the body of a man. If then neither of these is by itself a man, but that which is composed of the two together is called a man. And if God has called man to life and resurrection, he has called not a part, but the whole. And the last one that I will actually quote is this. That is Theophilus of Antioch in AD 181 to Autolycus. God will raise up your mortal flesh with your soul. And then having become immortal, you shall see the immortal. If you will believe in him now, and then you will realize that you have spoken of him unjustly. But you do not believe that the dead will be raised. When it happens, then you will believe whether you want to or not. But unless you believe now, your faith then will be reckoned as unbelief. And I'll quote one more guy. How about uh, young Tertullian? After the present age, this is an apology uh, in his apology of chapter 18. Oh, okay, there we go. All right. Yes, sir. That's Zadok at the bottom of the second round. Definitely appreciate that. Floor goes to William Bell. Are you ready, brother? All right. Ready? <laughs> you start the time ago. All right. Thank you. In this affirmative, I would like to expand on the nature of the resurrection. I'm getting some feedback from somewhere. I don't know why. And it's, it's, uh, Zadok, is that your mic on or something? That's yes, I'm, cu I'm cutting it off, Brother Bell. Okay, can I have a restart here? Thank you. All right, in this affirmative, I would like to expand on the nature of the resurrection and Christ's coming, or parousia, in judgment in the last days, fulfilled in the first century generation at the end of the age of Moses. The gospel was to be preached to all the nations, then the end would come. That's Matthew 24 and 14. So my first argument is taken from Matthew 24, 14 and Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. Now, my opponent and I share the view that Matthew 24, for the most part, was fulfilled in 70 AD. I think he takes the whole, at least most of the chapter, although he may see some parts of it as yet future, and we can sort that out later. In direct response to the question following the discussion of Matthew 24, 30, uh, 23, 34 through 37, about the destruction of Israel's temple and within that generation, the disciples asked Jesus a question privately about when these things would occur, namely, when will these things be, what will be the sign of your parousia or presence and of the end or consummation of the age? Among other signs, Jesus gives one major sign to the apostles regarding the preaching of the gospel to all the nations, uh, the then known inhabited earth. He says, in this gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached in all the inhabited earth as a witness to all the nations, then the end shall come. My position is that this world evangelism occurred and was completely fulfilled by the apostles in their very own generation, just as the Bible states in Matthew 24, 34. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation would by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, there are parallel texts for the preaching of the gospel to all the world, found in Mark 16, 15, where he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all the creation. Acts 1, 8, preach beginning in Jerusalem, then to Judea, Samaria, and to all the land. Uh, Paul affirmed that every instance of this was fulfilled before 70 AD, showing uh, that the end in mind was the destruction of the temple, just as Jesus stated to the apostles in Matthew 24, and according to Daniel 70 weeks. Romans 1, 8 says the gospel had gone into all the cosmos, that's Mark 16, 15. Romans 10, 18 says the gospel had gone to all the inhabited earth or the Orchomene and to all the land, fulfilling Matthew 24, 14 and Acts uh, 1, 8. Also, Romans 16, 25 and 26, the gospel had been preached to all the nations for obedience of the faith. That's Matthew 24, 14. Colossians 1, 5 and 6, the gospel had gone to all uh, to the Colossians as it has in all the cosmos. That's Mark 16, 15. And Colossians 1.23, the gospel had gone to all the creation, again, fulfilling Mark 16.15. Therefore, all the terms of preaching the gospel by the apostles to the generation in the first century occurred and was completed before 70 AD in the last days of the nation of Israel, which is the fulfillment of the word to all the nations, Isaiah 2, 1 and 2 and Luke 24.47. Now, the judgment and resurrection of Daniel 12.2 and 3 
was to occur when the gospel had been preached to all the world by the apostles. That's Acts 17, 30 and 31, which uh, I believe most uh, futurists take to be uh, a reference and a, cor a correlating text with all of the second coming passages that we have in the New Testament. And so do I. We just differ on the time. But I'm going to demonstrate here that Acts 17, 30 and 31 is the same time frame and event of Matthew chapter 24, 14, which I've just demonstrated happened before 70 AD or, and concluded in the end that occurred there. Acts 17, 30 and 31 is a parallel text to Matthew 24, 14 and also Daniel 12, 2, 3, 4. Uh, in this argument, my task is to prove that the same apostles commissioned by the same Christ in Matthew 24, 14, preached the same message to the same inhabited earth, to the same nations within the same imminent time frame called this generation from which they were to save themselves, as I said earlier, in the same last days concerning the same judgment and parousia, which was the time of the resurrection in the first century, as these cannot be separated per uh, 2 Timothy 4.1. Now, truly, uh, Acts 17.30, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he is about to judge, Mello is used there, the world, the inhabited earth, just like Matthew 24.14, in righteousness, which is the gospel, by the man, that's the son of man in Matthew 24, Jesus, whom he has ordained, and he has a given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now let's break down the text. It was a command for immediate action because he said now, that's the first century generation in the apostles' time. It was to all men everywhere. That would be all the nations, just like in Matthew 24. That's the parallel text of 24:14, also found in Luke 24, 46 and 47, that repentance and remission of sins which is the gospel of the kingdom, should be preached to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. They were to repent, that is, the gospel of the kingdom, because they were told to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Mark 1, 13 and 14, Matthew 3, 2, and Matthew 4 and verse 17, because he has appointed a day. Well, the end in Matthew 24, 14, as well as Daniel 12, 4, was already appointed, according to Daniel 12 and verse 1. And furthermore, uh, it was about to occur because he says he was about to judge uh, uh, on this day. And uh, therefore, since judgment and resurrection are concurrent events, that means the resurrection was about to occur. So the world or the inhabited earth, the judgment for the same inhabited earth of Matthew 24, 14 was near in that generation and about to occur. In righteousness means in the gospel. That's Romans 1 and 16 and uh, Matthew 24, 14. By the man whom he has ordained again, which is Christ who was the judge coming in Matthew 24, 30 in the clouds. Now, to refute my argument, Zadok is going to have to deny that Acts 17.30 would be fulfilled in the last days. He's going to have to show how the very same apostles are preaching throughout the world today. In fact, Jesus said the apostles would not have finished fleeing from persecution in the cities of Israel until the Son of Man came, Matthew 10 and verse 23. The very Saturday evening following our three-man debate that Zadok referenced, he mentioned in his post-debate review that Matthew 10.23 was more likely supported uh, the 70 AD coming of Christ. So he can tell us tonight if, if he still holds that uh, view or what he thinks about it. Now, the second thing I want to demonstrate, so what that argument showed was that every element of Acts 17, 30 and 31 is found in Matthew 24, 14, which my opponent agrees is AD 70. And he also agrees that Acts 17, 30 is Matthew 25 and all the rest of the end time passages. Uh, if, doesn't, if he doesn't, he can tell us. Now, how the people in Jesus' time understood the meaning of the phrase or the term parousia and the word appearing or epiphania and also the word dunamis for power, all of which are used in coming again passages. Two of them are in Matthew 24. The others are in other texts. Josephus, uh, for a historical reference, was a Jew, a priest, a Pharisee, and a general in Israel's army who lived contemporary with the apostles. He recorded a conversation with the Jews who resisted the setting up of an image of Caesar in their land. Their resistance would have, been, would have occasioned bloodshed and war with Rome, so they appeal to Petronius to petition uh, Caesar that they might be spared the indignity of setting up an idol to Caesar. So they spoke of God making his parousia, the same word in um, uh, Matthew 24, 3 and other uh, coming again passages, and the word appearing, which is in at least three of them. It's in 2 Timothy 4, 1, 1 Timothy 6, 13, and also um, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. 
Now, this shows how the Jews, the Romans, and the Greeks understood the terms. It also shows how God made his parousia an appearing. And it shows how Jesus, who saw the Father, would make his parousia an appearing. When, and this is the quote. When Petronius had said this and had dismissed the right assembly of the Jews, he desired the principal of them to take care of their husbandry and to speak kindly to the people and encourage them to have good hope of their affairs. Thus he did readily bring the multitude to be cheerful again. Now watch. Wow. And now God did show his presence, that's the word parousia, to Petronius and signify by signs to him that he would afford him his assistance. That is, God is going to assist him, but he's going to show him that through signs. And then it says, but God sent down, uh, and for he had no sooner finished his speech that he made to the Jews, but God sent down great showers of rain, contrary to human expectation. For that day was a clear day, gave no sign by the appearance of the sky of any rain, nay, the whole year had been subject to a great drought, and made men despair of any water from above, even when at any time they saw the heavens overcast with clouds, inasmuch that when such great quantity of rain came, that in an unusual manner and without any other expectation of it, the Jews hoped that Petronius would by no means fall, fail in his position for them. But as to Petronius, he was mightily surprised when he perceived that God evidently took care of the Jews and gave very plain signs of his appearance. That's the word epiphania, the manifestation of a hidden divinity. And to such degree that those who were in earnest were much inclined to the contrary, had no power left to contradict or to dissuade it. And it also says, moreover, that God, who was their governor, had shown his power or dunamis most um, evidently on their account, and that such a power as his left no room for doubt about it. So what I'm saying is God showed his invisible presence, parousia, his appearing as a hidden divinity, and his power by being, bringing rain as a sign that they had no other uh, reasons to believe that it would happen, had a whole year of drought, and that's how it was manifested and said there was no doubt by them that God had made an appearance to them. So I'm saying to you, that's the way they understood the terms parousia, uh, epiphania, and uh, the power of God being expressed of a divine being who has no flesh and bone appearing to them. And that's the way we should be understanding it rather than using our Western mind concept. I don't know how much time I have, but I'll yield at this point. No, no, no. We have we have a rebuttal of ten minutes from the first fifteen minute round.
Okay, I'm ready. All right. So, hey, 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 brothers and sisters, look, William Bell can say all day what I got to prove. I ain't got to prove nothing. I'm the person who's proven that the resurrection goes beyond 70 AD and that the church who directly learns. Look, when you when look, look, the, if, if, if we're students of the apostles, right, like Polycarp being a direct student under John is Ephesus and Polycarp inherits the bishop seat. In, in Ephesus from John, when he speaks on the resurrection and what they're still hoping for in the future, I got I can't just dismiss that. No, he's not one of the apostles. Neither is me or William Bell. So to be fair, these are men. But I'm showing us men who lived at that time. The only men they will probably go and quote are Gnostics. Maybe go quote Basilides or somebody like that. The Gnostics who may have been only people in antiquity of the first and second century who actually may sound kind of like the way preterists sound when they uh, 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 talk about the literal resurrection versus the spiritual one. And remember, we're not denying the, re the, the resurrection in the spirit, but we are establishing the truth of the literal resurrection of the body. As a matter of fact, let's listen to young Jesus. Jesus says this in the book of John chapter six. I'm going to skip down for the sake of time to around verse... Uh, oh, here we go. This is verse 44. Uh, no man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man have seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that if a man eats thereof, uh, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. So when Yeshua talks about them not uh, 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 dying, he's speaking in the context of death forever. You know, the same way he actually told the apostles, 
that not one head on a head would perish, but we all, know, we all know that they eventually got martyred. The language is telling you something. And here, Yeshua is actually letting it be known that there is a literal resurrection. And he told you how he's given people. They got to drink from him. They got to eat of him. And he'll give them life so that they never die. But in what context? Let's back up. Verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which he have sent me, that of all which he have given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, if you go to Matthew chapter 12, brothers and sisters, y'all know that Yeshua gave the people of that generation, he gave them a sign. And if you go and do the research and he talked about them being raised up, let me go there right quick. Let's go to the book of Matthew. I think that's Matthew chapter, this one is in my head, Matthew, okay, yes, Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12, I just want to read this right quick. Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to skip down for the sake of time to verse 30. Eight, um, and the certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign of thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now that's literal. Now look at what else he said literally gonna happen. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a one greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Now, brothers and sisters, if y'all go and look at this word rise, it's literally the same word that is used here. Look at this. Let's go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Because what we're dealing with is of course, our, our four preterist brothers don't seem to argue against the fact that Yeshua literally rose from the grave. So when he talked about these signs, they all for him meant literal resurrection. But then when he talks about raising up those who God gave him at the last day, not immediately while he's talking to them, he's giving them everlasting life. They're going to eat something. They're going to drink something that gives them everlasting life. But when will it come to his fullness? When he does what the father gave him the power to do, raise him up at the young last day. But look at what Paul tells Agrippa. This is Acts chapter 26, and I'm going to read at verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none of the things that knows which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. Y'all, the first. So he's not the last that's going to rise from the dead. When Yeshua rose from the dead, it wasn't just about no, oh, 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 he spiritually rose in his heart. No, he was the first to literally rise from the dead. That's why he's called the firstborn or the first fruits, because there are others who are going to literally rise from the dead. As a matter of fact, don't the book of Matthew claim that even when Yeshua rose from the grave at the power of the, or, or, or when his body went into the grave, one of those that that bodies of others came up out of the ground and they came into Jerusalem and were seen of many. You see how the sign of his death and resurrection is even led to an, a witness that, hey, this man coming up out of the grave is what this means. A literal raising of the dead. And I'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, y'all got to understand if what this brother is saying here today is the only truth and he said it twice going I hope it's replays in this room. He said it twice that there is that it's not about a literal resurrection and it was this and it was that and it was this and it was that and it was this and it was that. Well, how about this? In the book of first Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 15, I mean, verse four, uh, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, notice the juxtaposition, his literal raising out of the grave. How say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's telling you that the resurrection they're preaching is really going to happen because they're preaching that Christ did it, as we just read, by Paul's mouth to Agrippa first. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, 
then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yeah, and we are also found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, so Christ himself establishes the literal rising of the flesh from the dead. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and you're yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are most miserable. Now, if Christ now, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, that's the literal death of the body. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So if 70 AD is it, then all the dead are supposed to be raised. And all of that stuff in the book of Revelation 20 and all of that, all of that was supposed to have happened already. Now, of course, to, of course my, 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 my opponent, our full preterist brother, he would say that, yes, it actually did happen in 70 AD. But brethren, listen to this. It says this, uh, verse 29, or else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they why are they then baptized for the dead? So he's letting you know about others besides Christ that they had got baptized for. And it was like, look, why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, the Lord, that I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? So brothers and sisters, look, look at this. Let us eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. So Paul is letting you know, what have I gone through all of this for? He said, I die daily. Meaning what? I go through this process waiting for the ultimate process, which was just like Christ. Now we'll end here. Some will say, how are the dead raised up? Let's see how it would have had happened in 70. And with what body do they come? You fool. That which so is not quick and accepted die, right? And then he talks about in verse 40, there are celestial bodies and body terrestrial. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, meaning it goes in the grave. And remember, Christ's body couldn't stay in the grave because it was not going to see corruption according to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, prophecy of David. We all corrupt and lay in lying weight of the resurrection. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, your mic is on mute, and I don't know if you're trying to say something. Okay, yeah. There you go. Oh, gotcha, my brother. Oh, William Bell. Before we start, I have a question. Um, I thought this was supposed to be a 10 minute rebuttal. For disputed. Oh, you call that a rebuttal with, with uh, new info? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, if that's what you want to call it. No, I just wanted to be clear on the rules. Okay, that's all. I just wanted to be clear on the rules. Okay, th that's good. I'm ready. Yes, okay. All right, so what I'm going to do is address the arguments that Zadok mentioned, and uh, as many as I can, uh, that's difficult to do in a 10-minute um, uh, span. But he brought up a text in Matthew chapter 8, and he talked about uh, the uh, many would come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Uh, but he didn't emphasize the other part of the text that says, when you yourselves are cast out. So the text actually gives us the time. Now, we have Zadok, therefore, on record saying that that is the resurrection. When you go to Isaiah chapter 49 uh, and verse, uh, I'd say around verse 8, the text says, thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I've helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the land 
to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves that you shall feed along the roads and their pasture shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall str strike them. He who has mercy on them will lead them even by the springs of the water of life. I will make each of my mountains a road. My highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. And look, those from the north and the west and from the land of Sinem, et cetera. So he's quoting uh, a part of the text from Isaiah 49. But also in that text, notice that he said that's when uh, he, uh, he would say, I've heard them in an acceptable time, which is a reference to Jubilee. Now, when you go to the second chapter of Corinthians, this is what Paul said in quoting the very text from Isaiah 49, which is a part of that text of, of the East and the West. He said, we then, verse one, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So the resurrection that Paul was talking about and that Zadok just admitted was the eschatological resurrection that they come from the East and the West, Paul said was taking place in the first century. Now, there's one thing he doesn't quite get about the preterist position. He's saying, well, we already know there is um, uh, spiritual resurrection. But what he does understand was that the resurrection out of sin death was not a one point action. It was a process that began on the day of Pentecost and that consummated in 70 AD. And I will demonstrate that now. But let's go to Matthew uh, chapter eight. I've mentioned that. Let's look at the parallel text in Luke so you can see uh, further the context of those that he was talking to in Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse uh, 26, I believe it is. Luke 13, 26, Jesus was speaking to people in the first century generation. Zadok wants to go all out beyond, way beyond the 70 weeks of Daniel, the last days and the fall of the temple and talk about people that are not even in the Bible. And the text says, in verse um, 26, it says, then you, this is when the master rises up and shuts the door. He says, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. I don't think Jesus has been on Zadok Street at any time in my lifetime, or he is. But he will say, I tell you that I do not know you where you're from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Same text in Matthew 8, 11 and 12. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out, they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, uh, the last, uh, they're the last two will be first and the first will last. So the time frame for that event occurring is when the Jews were cast out. That's 70 AD in the first century. He's admitted that's the second coming. Now, let me give him another one to cover all that he said on 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll have more to say on that as time progresses. But in um, Isaiah chapter 27, Isaiah 27, uh, Isaiah talks about the time of the sounding of the trumpet, the gathering of Israel. And he talks about the taking away of Israel's sins. So in Isaiah 27 and verse nine, he says, therefore, by this, the iniquity, now iniquity is sin. The iniquity of Jacob will be covered. And this is the fruit of taking away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar, like chalk stones that are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense altars shall not stand. Yet the fortified city, will be desolate, the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. Then he goes on to say, and it shall come to pass, this is verse 12, in that day that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. So there's the gathering. And then he says, so it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. That's Matthew 24, 31. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. That's not physical Jerusalem. Jesus said they wouldn't do that in John 4, neither in Gerizim or the physical city. That's the new Jerusalem. But nevertheless, uh, and that also parallels Zechariah 14, 16 and following, by the way, uh, where they come and worship. But let's go to uh, Romans 11. Now, I'm sure that at least I think he would uh, take Romans 11, 25, I mean, 26 and 27 to be the second coming of Christ to be the parousia. But notice, 
he said in Isaiah 27, this would be when Jacob's iniquity would be covered and the fruit of the taking away of his sin. So let's see if sin was taken away all at once from the beginning, or was there something else involved or a consummation of that process at the coming of Christ? In Romans eleven twenty six, 26, and so all Israel will be saved. That's future tense. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, a quote from Isaiah 59, 20 and 21, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Well, that's the text in Isaiah 27. For this is my covenant to them when I take away their sins. That's a text relating to the future. That's the time of the coming of Christ. It's the consummation of the atonement mentioned in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is parallel to Romans 11. He just finished talking about the times of the Gentiles. He sees that as future. But a lot of them take the times of the Gentiles to be Romans 11 as well, even though they're not exactly the same, but they happen at the same time, so it doesn't really matter. The point being is, he said, when he comes out of Zion, that's when he would take away their sins. That's his covenant to them. By the way, all the passages Zadok uh, covered in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, verse 10, and verse 12, said Jesus died for our sins. It didn't say he died to raise us out of the dirt. Uh, furthermore, another uh, point that, uh, that he raised was in John chapter 6. Well, John 6 says that he would raise them up at the last day. All right? Tell us, when is the last day of the kingdom of God? Show us where a kingdom, Luke 1, 32 and 33, that has no end, also Isaiah 9, 7, uh, has no end, can have a last day. You can't put a last day on a kingdom that has no end. So it had to refer to a kingdom that had an end, and that was Israel's national kingdom. Uh, so he's not going to talk about the last days because uh, it's just not going to fit his paradigm for eschatology, and that's why he's getting into these problems and not understanding what he's talking about. Now, uh, two more minutes. All right, let's take, um, let's take one other uh, point that he made. Like I said, there's not enough time to do this uh, discussion and to do justice to it. But uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, he raised some issues there. And uh, he, oh, yes, let's just get the first fruit. All right, he talked about the first fruit. He says, Christ is the first fruit of them that slept. First fruit has a connotation out of Leviticus 23. The word means the first of the harvest, and it also means eminence, that the harvest has begun. So it began with Christ. Now, when you look at the first fruits in Leviticus 23, there was also a second portion that was taken on Pentecost. So I want to ask Zadok, where are the physical bodies that came out from the graves on the day of Pentecost? And if you say those in Matthew 27, 51 were a part of the first fruits, did they die again? Did they have eternal life? And how did they become first fruits before those on Pentecost, which James says came, became first fruits as a result of obeying the gospel? I guess that's my time, and I will conclude there. Fifty seconds. <laughs> okay, well, let me get another one. All right, in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, he he cited this text. He doesn't understand what sowing the body is. He's trying to make it a physical body. I challenge him to find a physical body for the dead ones in 1 Corinthians 15. Those were the ones who were dead prior to the death of Christ because Christ rose out from them. So here's the question in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse, 30, um, verse 34 through 36. He says, awake to righteousness, not awake to another physical body or some kind of individual body. He says, awake to righteousness. That's what life is in the gospel. And do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. But someone will say, how are the dead ones raised up? It doesn't say physical bodies. It says dead ones. Now, they were already physical dead. And then notice what he says. What you sow, you do not sow the body that shall be. You can't sow a dead body. You have to sow a live body in order for it to rise. Thank you. Five minutes, yeah, yeah. Seven and a half minutes. They are pursuing you whenever you're ready to go. No problem. I'm a smoker. I'm, 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 you know, no problem. All right. Yeah, I'm a smoker's boots in seven minutes and 28 seconds. How about that? So, once again, he's talking about all this stuff I got to prove. Oh, when he, don't forget, he get to ask me questions. He get to put me on the hot seat. 
and I get to put him on a hot seat as well. So I'll deal with some of that stuff when he asks it directly. But at the end of the day, check this out. He makes this claim about, oh, Jesus said you and you and you, brothers and sisters, if he wants to go and he's going to go and show, oh, let's go to Leviticus and talk about the first fruits and things like that. Well, if you're going to keep the same energy, brother, then how about we do something like possibly take a look at how Moses spoke in the book of uh, Deuteronomy when he spoke to the children of Israel at his death. How about Moses said something like this? He says, uh, gather unto me that this is uh, what, what uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse uh, <clears throat> uh, 27. I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Behold, while I, while I am yet alive with you this day, your tribes, your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death, you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Now, if you go to the book of Joshua, it says the generation that was under the authority of Joshua and the elders of his day kept the word of God and they fought and they did everything that they were supposed to do. So that literal generation died out. Then it says a generation was born afterward that didn't know Joshua. And it was that generation that went aside. And then the time of the judges start with the roller coaster back and forth. So when Moses was saying, you, you've been hard headed since I've known you and this, that, and the third, the corporate speak to the nation still don't demand that that generation is going to see everything that that person is literally saying at that time. So you're going to have to give the same license to Yeshua because we know that if we did a Bible study, we could prove that this generation that followed with Joshua didn't corrupt itself. That generation did what the Most High told it. And it was the generations that came that never even met Joshua face to face that corrupted themselves. And then, of course, we know that all this stuff in Deuteronomy 28 that Moses spoke to them and said, this will happen to you if you keep the covenant. And this will happen to you if you break the covenant. And then he said, the Lord shall do this and you shall be put in captivity. That generation Moses was literally speaking to in Deuteronomy. They ain't seen none of that. But he kept saying this is what was going to happen to them who he was speaking to because he's speaking to the nation corporately. But at any rate, how about this? Let's actually, since he's talking about there, notice how he thought in the last rebuttal, I didn't rebut him, but I just rebutted everything showing y'all the literal resurrection of the dead while he keeps making it a non-literal resurrection. While we are pointing out there is a type of resurrection that happens, but that's not the be all end all. And guess what, everyone? Yeshua showed us because that first fruits, that imminent first fruits that he spoke of, when he rose from the dead, he literally rose from the dead and the damn body was gone. If it ain't got nothing to do with the body being risen, then guess what? Wasn't no reason for a body to not be there. Then he kept showing himself alive. Touch me, it's me. Look at the hole. Look at this, that, and the third. Hey, I'm not a figment of your imagination. I'm not a phantasm. He said, a phantasm of a, your imagination wouldn't be touchable. Brothers and sisters, then he was with them for 40 days. And then that body that was risen from the dead disappeared in the cloud, according to Acts chapter one. Brothers and sisters, look, I'm going to go to the book of Revelation. Let's go to the book of Revelation because I already established earlier. I already did the setup showing you that historically, that first, second, and third generation of the apostles, uh, 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 disciples, those who learned from the apostles and learned from their uh, 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 disciples, brothers and sisters, they actually believe that John was put on the island of Patmos during the reign of Domitian. I gave y'all about four or five sources that made that claim. I wasn't there, so I'm going to go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, you know what, they probably had a strong argument in that case. So since I'm saying that John was shown this about 20 years or so after the destruction of Jerusalem during the reign of Emperor Domitian, Let's look at what was said in Revelation and let's see if these people were still waiting for crowns. This is a young dog. You know, William Bell would probably not agree. He would put it in the time of Nero. He would have John probably on the island of Patmos sometime around the year 66 or 67 because he need everything to be over, to be over by 70. But of course, we know that that's, that that's not sound. But hey, check this out. So in the book of Revelation chapter two, to the church in Ephesus, this is what he says in verse seven. 
he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the church is, to him that overcome will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We're going to continue in this chapter uh, to the church in Smyrna, verse 11. I'm sorry. Verse 11, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Why? Because when you go over to chapter 20, you talk about those who make the first resurrection on them, the second death have no power. But let's keep going to the church of Pergamum. He actually says this here in verse 17. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the churches. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saveth he. Let's go right over to chapter three. What does it say in Revelation chapter three, since all of this was written on Patmos and showed on Patmos about 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, which I have pro which I proved to y'all earlier. Hey, check this out. Verse 12 of chapter three. To him that overcome will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirits say unto the churches. So brothers and sisters, they were still waiting for crowns 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. When John received this vision, it was told to let the churches in Asia know, hey, you better get it together because when I come to gather, these are the things I will give. And to those who don't make it, they'll be getting something else. They will be getting his judgment and his torment. And last but not least, I'll just say this for the record. We all know that uh, the uh, that the Pharisees and them actually all believed in the resurrection of the literal body. And Paul let you know through his entire ministry, brothers and sisters, it was literally the resurrection of the dead that he was being called in question about. And he was letting the church know it is that resurrection like the Lord showed us. That's the same thing that we will rest in hope in. Or as he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord will descend from heaven with the shout of the archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That did not happen at 70 AD. And when we get into this question and answer segment, I got some questions for Brother Brown. Let's see how he do at that time. Seven and a half minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me um, correct another misunderstanding that I think that Zadok has concerning our view of resurrection. We don't deny the physical resurrection of Christ. Uh, he demonstrated that he was not a spirit. He ate and he told him to touch, feel, and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bone as, yet, as you see I have. What we're saying is that that is not the essence of the eschatological resurrection. Let me give you um, a text to uh, support that. When you turn to the sixth chapter of Romans, the Bible tells you the death that Jesus died. In uh, Romans 6, beginning at verse um, 8, he says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Now watch verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So Jesus, in dying, died to sin. Now, why is his body coming into place? Zadok has mentioned that. That's because he used his body, or his body was used by God, as a sign to the believers to prove that he had risen from the dead. That's why he showed himself for 40 days with many infallible proofs. But the, um, the reason or the basis and purpose for his death was to deliver Israel from their sins. And that's the position that he took as well. As a matter of fact, how could Christ be the first fruit if the disciples came out of sin death before he did, if he didn't share that position with him? That's why he took upon him the sins of the world. Not that he sinned, but he did take on that position in order that he could become the firstborn from the dead ones. That's where he's the first fruit, and that's where those first fruit on the day of Pentecost of the same nature that his death uh, came with him and uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's one thing th that he misses. And of course, he didn't say anything about Romans 11. I guess he'll get to that and uh, about the other passages uh, that I mentioned. And of course, 
again, he's outside of the last days. He's not going to tell us. He said he doesn't have to tell us the last days. And I'll tell you the reason that he's not going to tell us, because the moment he defines what the last days is, he's going to find himself on the outside of them, way out of the purview of Scripture. Uh, now, he's, he wants to make his arguments on Revelation. The book of Revelation uh, was written prior to 70 AD. There's lots of evidence for that. I have some of that, which we can go over later. But let me just mention a few things. Now, in Matthew 24 and verse 30, we have the text that says that um, Christ would, uh, all the tribes of the land would mourn and they would see Christ coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's a quote from Daniel 7 and also Zechariah chapter 12, uh, verses 12 through 14. And um, that text is quoted in Revelation 1 and verse 7. Now, here's the point. In Matthew 24, 30, it says, or rather 34, it says, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, Zadok wants to argue that the word generation there can mean a generation that is far removed from the first century or that it starts in their day and continues on now. Well, again, Peter told them to save themselves from that wicked and perverse generation. And in Philippians 2 and verse 15, Paul said, uh, do all things um, uh, without murmurings and, and complaints. Uh, where you shine as lights in the midst of a crook and perverse generation. So they were living in that generation. That generation uh, has passed a long time ago, and that's when those things would be fulfilled. So if Revelation 1-7, which is Christ coming on the clouds, is Matthew 24-30, then Revelation 1-7 happened in that generation, and all this brouhaha that he's talking about with all this historical information is outside of Revelation. Here's another point. You have the marriage in Revelation, which takes place after the city is destroyed. That's the same uh, motif that you have in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, also in uh, Matthew 22. And in Revelation 19, the city is destroyed, or the harlot that persecuted the prophets, which Jesus said was Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 37. And Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 14 through 16, when that city was destroyed, that's when the marriage came. That's also Revelation 21, because you don't have two marriages, and therefore, that's 70 AD. So he can't get the book of Revelation outside of that. I don't care how much so-called historical information he tries to present in order uh, to do that. Uh, let's see. And he talked about the Pharisees. And I know that his argument is that the Pharisees had the same premise or same position on resurrection that Paul had. That is a fallacy. The Pharisees did believe... Uh, on some accounts, so they had several views of resurrection, but one of their views was that they believed that you would be raised again in the afterlife. That was one view, and you can see that in Josephus, uh, book 18, I think, of Antiquities, but also they had another view based on uh, what probably they misunderstood in the prophets, that they were going to be raised up, like he quoted earlier in Isaiah 37, I mean, in Ezekiel 37, that they would be returned to their land, and so they had a view of the resurrection that they were going to get their land free from oppression, etc. That is not what Paul believed. And the proof of that is they had put Paul on trial for his views on the resurrection. You heard Zadok quoted, I think that's uh, Acts chapter 24 and maybe 21. For that one reason, uh, he was being charged. But look at what he says. And these are not the Sadducees because the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. He says, nor can they prove the things whereof uh, they have accused me. For according to the way in which they call a sect, that's the Pharisees, referring to Paul as a heretical sect, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And by the way, he doesn't quote the passages correctly, because when you look at the Greek, it says, I have hope in God, which they also accept that there is about to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. Same thing in Acts chapter 26, 6 through 8, when he quoted about Christ being the first, the word mellow is there, the first to rise from the dead and to show light to the people, et cetera. That is mellow in that text as well. Uh, all things written in the law and the prophets. I think that's about all the time that I have uh, for, uh, for this session. Demetrius, how are we doing on time? Is that it? Uh, a minute and 10 seconds. Let's see, what else, uh, what else is there? Uh, Deuteronomy, yes, Deuteronomy. Moses said these things would happen after they died. He's the text of Deuteronomy 32 uh, that he quotes, which is a part of chapter 31 as well, are the things that Hebrews 10 talks about. And he says the judgment was about to come in a very, very little while. Hebrews 10, read verse 30 all the way through to verse 37. And you will see that he's talking about something that was about to happen in their day. So the last days are still in the first century. Zadok tried to get it out of there. He just can't do it. Thank you.
I see now that it's two minutes. So you keep okay. the 18, you want 20 minutes, and now I'll keep the, the two minutes, okay, Demetrius? Uh, which one you want me to keep again? Keep the 20 minute round, and I'll okay. find the two minute response. Okay, sweet deal. Gotcha. Okay, are we ready? Yes, sir. When you start. Okay, okay. my first question, question is, is, is would you define? define the period of the last days according to the scriptures. Yes, I'm right. Yeah, 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 no problem. Uh, the book of Daniel chapter two. Uh, so when we go to the book of Daniel chapter two, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was actually given a vision and for some reason, hold on brother. Hey, hey pause for a sec, my Bible app. Oh no, okay, there it goes, there it goes. Don't pause the time, I won't need that much. So here in the book of Daniel chapter two, uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar is shown this vision uh, of this great Colossus uh, type narrative here. And then it lets you know here, it says, um, <clears throat> verse 44, uh, when the image is hit in the feet of this Colossus, that this lets us know the time frame in history when something is gonna happen. And in the days of these kings shall, the, this is verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as you saw that a stone was cut out without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, and the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king that that which shall come to pass hereafter. But what's interesting about it is this. It actually says it like this. It says that, um, wait, hold on. Let me back up and in verse, um, hold on. Verse 44, notice this. I read this already, but I wanted to reemphasize it. I thought it was the end of 43. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. And, breth and brethren, we know that when you go and look at it, uh, uh, Mr. Bell, you see that it was a stone that hit. So the king, so it, and it grows into a mountain that fills the entire earth. So the kingdom of God is a process uh, the eschatological uh, 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 end of the covenant age of Israel under their old covenant. I don't have an issue with, but I'm telling you it, that is not the beginning and the end of the last days, but it is simply the beginning of the last days and we are still in them. Go ahead, sir. Okay, I do get a clear understanding of when you say the beginning of it was and when does it end? Can you just give us that in scripture? It starts in the time of the Roman Empire and it doesn't, and, and the kingdom itself doesn't end. It starts and then it grows and fills a mountain. And when you saw the image and you saw that it crumbled and it, and it started to blow away like the summer threshing floor, uh, a chaff left by the wheat until it was found no more. That was the process that started with the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God in the midst of, as the Roman Empire was coming into near its zenith. That's what happened in the first century. And that was when the kingdom of God was being set up. But in it being set up, that was not the total fulfilling of it. We're still in the process of it growing into a mountain that fills the earth. Okay. Um, would, you, would you agree that Matthew 13, 39 and 40, that speaks of the end of the age, is a quote from Daniel, and refers to the time of the resurrection. Matthew 13 and what verse, sir? 39 and 40. 39 and 40? Age is in that text. 39 and 40. Hold on, let me get there. Let me get there. Matthew 13, verse 39 and 40. And the enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of the world. No. No, I don't agree that that's uh, 70 AD. Okay, does the text say the end of the age? Yes, it does. Okay, can you show us in scripture where there is an end of the kingdom? No, there is no end of the kingdom. So when the disciples died, like the sun in the kingdom, they did that 
after the end of I'm sorry, wait, 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 hold on, Mr. Bell. I think LB was saying something. Okay, pause the time. I want to make it so clear. I should have done this before. I apologize. That you must make it clear if you want to be at your conference. Oh, okay. Okay, no, no problem. I'm still tracking with Mr. Bell, though. Go ahead, sir. Okay, all right. All right, the next question. The next question is Galatians chapter 3. Uh, Galatians 3. No, no, let's, let's, let's get Galatians 3. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Okay, hold on. Acts 3. I'm following you. Okay. And um, this question will flow out of verses 24 of chapter 3 down through verses 1 and 2. Wait, hold on. What, what, what do you, I'm sorry. What do you mean? For, oh, oh, into, going into the next chapter, you're saying? Yes. yes. Okay. I don't see the chapter that you're okay. using as a... a, a, a um, Break, Break up the sentence. The it's the same sentence. Yes. So, so Peter, Peter was talking about the fulfillment of all things that were spoken, spoken by the prophets, prophets beginning from Moses to Samuel and all, all the prophets that followed after. And he, and he said, said that, that uh, they, they had spoken, spoken of those, those days in which, which they, they were living. living. He cites Moses, Moses from Deuteronomy 18. But in verse 25, he says that they were the sons of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with their fathers, say to Abraham, in your seed all families of the earth should be blessed. Now in verse 26, he defines that blessing as turning them away from their iniquities. Which you agree, according to Ephesians 2, that to forgive sin is a resurrection, a spiritual resurrection. So yes, for those who believe. What is, what the, is resurrection the resurrection in this, this context, context that the Sadducees, the priests, priest and the captain, and the captain of the of temple, temple uh, uh, have become uh, grieved about in terms of the preaching of Peter in this day? Well, they become well, grieved in the fact that they're claiming that Jesus rose from the dead, sir. Remember, they thought that they, they thought that they put the blasphemy to death. They didn't believe in his resurrection. They even hired, they were allowed by Pilate to hire guards to stand outside of the tomb, but they never confirmed his resurrection. So literally, with Pentecost, within two months of you believing you have put this man to death now you got his 12 followers walking in his same gifts to the point that people put the dead out in i mean put people out in the street according to acts 5 and acts chapter 6 just hoping that when peter and them walked by his shadow could heal people so the very thing that they thought they got rid of the men who abandoned him are now back and they're claiming he's alive and this is what they fear but they couldn't deny when the man got healed at the uh, uh, a beautiful gate that something had done. So they had their little side meeting like, yo, how do we handle this? So when you go to verse one of chapter four, and they spake to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. So the way that they preach it, good brother, is them preaching, telling everyone that Christ literally rose from the dead. And as, um, and, and as Paul claimed, the 12 were his eyewitnesses. So they're preaching that in order to preach the message of salvation that the people ought to believe in and the resurrection of the dead further as you get through letters and, you know, more text. Okay. Uh, the text literally says they preached in Jesus the resurrection out from the dead. So let me give you another text. Oh, okay. In Philippians, the third chapter, uh, verses uh, Philippians 10 and 11, Philippians 3 and verse 11. Verse 11. Paul said that, uh, that he was that, being conformed uh, to the death of Christ, conformed to the death of Christ, that he might attain to the resurrection. And the word used there is ex on the station. The word used there is ex on the station. So it's mm -hmm. the resurrection out so from among the, the resurrection dead. out from among the dead. Now, mm -hmm. since Paul had not now, died, physically, Paul had not died. What resurrection is he what attaining to? Is he attaining to? <laughs> well, look. You got two you got two things happening, right? We read in another letter. I think I had read it earlier in the beginning of this uh in, in, in the beginning of this uh discussion between us. I think I quoted Colossians chapter two and verse twelve for you, where it says, We're buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who have raised him from the dead. So when you go through your faith narrative, you do take on a symbolism of what literally happened to him in the flesh and that flesh and blood body being raised anew as something different. Now you're raised as something different 
in your mind to walk in this newness of life. So that's partly of attaining unto the resurrection of Christ. But this is what's interesting. He's telling you this, not as though I had already attained, either we're already perfect. So he's letting you know that the resurrection that has already started in that daily back and forth of the old man dying and the new man raising and the conscience, that this is a process to leave you to lead you to something else. And he's telling you that I'm not speaking. What did it say? If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, whatever that resurrection is, he ain't claiming he got it yet. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after. And in some translations, it says, or as if I chase after that, I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended for Christ Jesus. So I just believe that he's looking forward to something as he says in verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before as I press, as you press that something you're going after toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of uh, God in Christ Jesus. And you know, Paul believed in the literal resurrection of the dead at the day of judgment. And he wanted to stay on that righteous lot, sir. Sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, no, no, I, don't I don't believe that he believed in a literal, literal physical resurrection. So now, mm -hmm. since you have acknowledged that this was not a physical resurrection and that Paul was looking forward to it, so you agree that he was looking forward to the resurrection that was non-physical. So is the mark of the high price of the calling of God, is that an eschatological goal that was being reached in view of the fact that he mentioned in verse 21 uh, about being conformed to the glorious body and then in chapter 4, where, where he continues the subject, he says the Lord, Lord was at hand. So this was this in view of that at hand coming of the Lord in Philippians chapter three. Well, remember this, Paul actually told you that there was a rest in hope. He even said this in first Thessalonians chapter, uh, wait, hold on. Let me get the text. Let me, I want to quote it correctly. Yes. First Thessalonians chapter four. I'm going to go there right quick. Where are we at here? Here. First Thessalonians, oh, cream corn, I'm running things. Here we go, First Thessalonians chapter four. And when we get here, good brother, pay very close attention at what he's talking about because he has no guarantee he's gonna see any of this, but look at how he speaks in the corporate sense to the church. But I, uh, verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep. So you got some people who are already dead that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. So what? Is it about those who are literally dead at the time he's speaking, good brother? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now, I believe he literally rose from his grave. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, look, listen to this. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. This is corporate talk. Paul can't guarantee he's going to be there, but he's talking about those of the church, whoever that is, the we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, we won't prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, the voice of an archangel, and the dead in Christ uh, 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 with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. So is that them who still walk in the spirit? And is he saying that those who he's talking about here are people who are just, uh, 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 um, they've actually uh, uh, fallen away from being righteous in Christ, but there's something that's going to happen at 70 AD and they're going to be awakened and they're going to believe in righteousness again. That's not what this is talking about, brother. This is the eschatological narrative that you that that he was pressing toward and all of it was not just fulfilled in the first century it, it, it just it just was okay um, was that time for me or time for him no that was time for me sir okay colossians chapter 3 paul makes a similar statement you've already mentioned colossians 2 11 and 12 where they had been buried in baptism and risen through faith in the operation of god so that yes. is a non-physical resurrection mm -hmm. and in verse 20 paul tells them uh, that they had died with Christ uh, mm -hmm. from the uh, basic principles. So in chapter three, he says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now in verse three of chapter three, he says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Mm -hmm. Were they physically dead? And what life was hidden if they were not physically dead? They had died to sin. Hold on a second. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. And, and what is the life in verse 
four that, that would appear you put your thought. thought. Sorry. Right. When, when, when he says, when Christ, who is our life, life appears, appears, then he will also appear. appear. So, so if they're hidden, hidden what is the appearing? And what is the death? And the light extends over against that death. death. In this case, case and is this the coming of Christ? Christ? Well, it, it's 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 the coming of Christ, but not the way that you full preterists think, sir. So let me actually go here and show you a little shum shum, right? This is what the this is what the apostle Peter actually talks about, right? So I'm gonna what well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna read two people right to, quick in this two minutes. I'm gonna go to Paul first. Let's go to the, uh, 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 to the book of Galatians, uh, chapter four. Now this is what he says. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. What is he talking about here? He's using the idea of Isaac being the promised child, excuse me, um, 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 in contrast to Ishmael or Abraham's other children. Why? Because there was a particular thing that God said about Isaac. And in that same way, the church corporately has been spoken. This is when the text talks about predestination of the church, this, that, and the third. So the church itself is born and the church in righteousness walks in Christ. But even though the church is literally in the face of the world, the church also is hidden because the writer of Hebrews says, brethren, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So while the church is already in a certain kind of resurrection, sir, what they shall be, the world don't see it yet. You know why? Because the world ain't witnessed the judgment day. They ain't risen. The world hasn't witnessed the second coming of Christ. The world has not witnessed that. But there is uh, something here that Peter says, right? He said, um, wait, hold on. Let me find this text right quick. Come on, come on at, hey, hold on for, no, okay, there we go. This app just want to mess up on the kid when I'm trying to smoke Brother Bell's boots. Come on. All right, so now where I want to go, I'm sorry, that was time? That's time. Ah, just that little buffer. Uh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, how much time do I have left for questions? Three minutes and 20 seconds. Three minutes, okay. Um, in Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31, do mm -hmm. you see the scope of Acts 17, 30 and 31 different or the same as that of Matthew 24, 14? And if so, show us the difference between the apostles, the scope of their, their message, their mission, uh, the nations to whom they preached, etc. Uh, as I put it in my uh, affirmative. Can you show the distinction in Acts 17, 30 versus Matthew 24? Well, yeah, it's not talking about the same thing um, because the Greek world won't be affected with anything that happened to Jerusalem, sir. When he makes this point in, at Mars Hill in Athens, believe me, bro, the people in Athens, if they heard that Jerusalem got beat up by the Romans and Jews is cast out of there, it ain't hurting Athens. But people in Athens got something to look forward to. So here we go. Um, verse 30. He's talking about how people need to get away from um, idolatry, right? And that all men are the offspring of God. Made, you know, made, you know, made by his hands. Uh, verse 30 says, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commend of all men everywhere to repent because he have appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. So a time is coming where Jesus Christ is actually going to judge the world, right? He's going to judge the world of men. And that world, and, and quote unquote, that word is that Greek word or kumene. It is not the, uh, it is not, the age. So when he's talking about judging the world, that literally means, sir, the inhabited earth, land, globe, terrain, the universe, the world, doesn't it, according to Vine's expository dictionary on New Testament words, Mr. Bell. So you see right here how in um how in Acts 17, you ain't gonna get away with the Aeon one for that one, homie. That one right there, you're gonna have to deal with the Akuminos. But then how about this one? How about I bring you over to where our good brother Peter had said something like this here out of his lip? What did Peter say? What did Peter say? Peter actually said, hold on. <clears throat> Acts 
Come on. Okay, here we go. You bet not say time either with my computer buffering like that. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says this. He says, uh, 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 verse 4, and they say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Not the children of Israel. Come on, son. You know what? I'll bring it back. I'll bring it back. No, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Huh? Okay. I'm sorry. It's 30 seconds. Okay. William Bell phones one more question. Go ahead, William. Okay. Well, you might want to look up Acts 17 30 because you will see the word Orkham in that text. It's not the word eon. Uh, That's what the, I just said, sir. No, you said that I, said I was it's saying that the word eon. I'm telling you it's Orkham in both passages in Matthew 24 14 and in Acts 17 30. Yeah, that's so the same that's word that they're preaching to. But anyway, that's that's fine. I mm -hmm. think uh, my time is just about gone. Um, yeah, that's time. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. yeah, yeah. Go now ahead. it's time for your boots to get smoked. All right, y'all go ahead and set that time so I can um, talk to the gentleman. Time set. All right. So, hey, 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 Mr. Bell, I'm, 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 I was reading out of Second Peter three, so I'm, 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 I'm gonna take you here with me in the book of Second Peter chapter three. This is interesting, right? Uh, the apostle Peter here, he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Now, according to John's letter in John, uh, 1 John chapter 2 and in 1 John 4, we know that he talks about their time being the last time. We know that in that the writer of Hebrews actually says that God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So last days, plural. Not the la not necessarily just the last day, but last days. You believe that the last days started with the preaching of John? Yes or no? This is a yes or no. With the yes. with the preaching of John and ending with seventy A.D. That was the last days. That was seventy A.D. marked the consummation of the age. So the last day would have been in seventy A.D. But the entire period from the time of John down to the fall of the temple would be the last days. And the okay. last day being the consummation of that covenant that ended so that it's gone and now we're into the messianic age. Okay, so continuing in this text, he says, some, some, um, some say, now these are the scoffers. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Is this an indication that the people were complaining that the things in the world of men, the sinful world of men, have been what they've been basically since men have been in their sinful nature? Is that the beginning of the creation he's talking about way back when Adam and Eve sinned? Do you think that's what Peter was saying the scoffers were referencing? Well, he says all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So if he's saying from the beginning of the creation, uh, he could be talking about the time prior to the time of Abraham, um, because he said, well, but the other part that he says in that text is since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. So you have to put the two of those together. Uh, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were since the beginning, beginning of the creation. Okay. Okay. And, and okay. So let's even say that was this side of the flood possibly, right? It says, for this they are will, will, willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, that's the cosmos, being overflowed with water perished. Is that referencing what happened with the time of Noah? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. correct. Okay, now, then now it talks about a whole nother age that doesn't start with the covenant Israelites in my opinion, but I want to see if you agree. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, so you have the heavens and the earth that got overflowed the first time, the, the earth with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You believe that this, rep, that, that, the, uh, that the judgment uh, the day of fire against uh, against the day, I'm sorry, the fire of the day of judgment and the judgment of the perdition of ungodly men that this is referencing 70 AD? Yes, yes. Uh, let, me, let me tell you why. Okay. First of all, 
Uh, Second Peter 3 is a quote from Deuteronomy 32, and verse 22, where when Moses is talking about Israel's last days, I think you might have to mute your mic and say that for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Bell. Um, oh, on Zoom, are you talking about Mr. Bell? Uh, yeah, that might be it because I'm, well, let me just take my uh, headset off. All right. So in Deuteronomy 32, he says uh, in verse 22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and he shall burn to the lowest uh, Gehenna. It shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So there's Peter's, I mean, there is uh, Moses' language about the end of heaven and earth there. Then in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 34, he actually uses the words that are found in 2 Peter chapter, um, chapter 3 and says that the time would be at hand when this would come to pass. Is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up among my treasures? Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand. All the things uh, to come hasten upon them for the Lord will judge his people. That's also quoted in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30. Now, when you get to 2 Peter 3, you have to remember that 2 Peter 3 is a reminder of what Peter had taught them in the first epistle, because he says, uh, beloved, now I write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So Peter has already told them about the end in the first epistle. And here's what he said. In chapter one, he says that um, uh, the last days, uh, they were in the time of the end for the inheritance to come in the last days. Then in chapter four, he tells them God was ready to judge the living and the dead. He uses the word hetoimos. And then in verse seven, he says, but the end of all things is at hand. And then in verse 17, he says, for the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what shall the end be of those who do not obey the gospel? Even if you go to chapter five of first Peter, Peter says that he was an elder uh, and also a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a, a partaker of the glory that was about to be revealed. And the glory about to be revealed was the new heavens and new earth. So he has already told them. All right, my time, go ahead. Uh, pretty much, yes, I would. No, from the time, the, the, the fathers were the time of the foundations being laid uh, for the world of Israel. And Israel was created, you know, during the time of Moses, um, of the trek from Egypt, etc. So that's when God made the covenant with them. And so when Moses was talking to them in Deuteronomy chapter 32, he was speaking to that first generation of Israel, but, um, or actually the first generation that pretty much died out, except a couple of them. But at the same time, that's the beginning of that creation. And that is the creation which Peter says is now that was reserved unto fire and judgment unto the day of and perdition of ungodly men. So when the scoffers come, they come asking, where is the promise of his coming? Now, why did they come in the first century asking that if they didn't believe that the coming, uh, that the apostles and the, uh, the disciples had taught, as well as Jesus, that the coming was going to occur in those days? That's why they came asking, where is the promise of his coming? And uh, he told them, as he had already said, the end was at hand. And now he's telling them that these things are about to occur.
Well, if, if he did speak of the destruction of a literal world, I need to understand what you mean by that. If you're talking about um, the complete dissolution of a physical universe, uh, if Josephus said that, it's certainly not biblical uh, because the Bible never talks about the end of the or dissolution of the physical world. Now, what the scriptures talk about, which is what I want to discuss, is the fact that there was a world that came into being after the world of Noah, and that was the world of Israel. That's the world that ended in 70 AD, but they had already begun tasting of the new world prior to its full dissolution. So when you look at Hebrews 6 and verse 5, the text says they have tasted of the powers of the age about to come. And the same thing in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5, the Orchumene that was about to come. So this new world begins in 70 AD, which is the new heavens and new earth that comes after the wedding, after the city is destroyed, and the city that was destroyed was Jerusalem. So that's when the new heavens and new earth arrives, because the old heaven and earth has been destroyed. That was the old covenant that I mentioned that marked the end of Israel's last day. So we're no longer in that covenant age. The Levitical sacrifice, priesthood, all of that's gone. We're now in the age of the Messiah. It has no end. So there is no end of heaven and earth of the new heavens and new earth because he says they shall remain he, uh, isaiah 65 also hebrews chapter 12 and verse uh 28 wherefore we re we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear and by the way in hebrews 12 he said there would only be one more shaking of heaven and earth and that that heaven and earth was already being shaken at the time that the text was written hebrews 12, 25 through, I think, verse 27. So there is no other shaking of a heaven and earth. Okay, uh, first of all, let's get to Acts 13. Again, Paul said that the Jews, the Pharisees, couldn't prove the things that they were accusing him of. And he said, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there is about to be a resurrection of the dead. The word mellow is there, and we keep not reading it in the text. He said there was about to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. And it wasn't a physical resurrection of bodies coming out of the ground for either. Uh, secondly, in verse 24 and 25, uh, 25 particularly, as he reasoned with uh, about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment about to come, Felix was afraid and answered. So resurrection and judgment are all concurrent events, and they were about to happen in the first century. That's the word mellow. Now, in terms of the resurrection of the just and of the unjust, only the righteous are raised to life. That's John 25. That's Daniel chapter 12. The wicked are raised to condemnation, but neither are raised physically to a physical body resurrection. It's the fact that one is raised to what the Bible calls life or righteousness. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some have not the knowledge of God. So righteousness, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 18, is the inheritance. It is life and it is righteousness. So righteousness is what? Justification from sin. That's what he's telling them to do. The wicked do not rise to justification to, uh, from sin. They rise to a, an, a, a um, uh, confirmation of their condemnation. That's the difference.
Okay, like I said before, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. They had two views. You can look in 2 Maccabees 7. You can also look in Josephus 18. And he also has a reference, I think, in Wars 2, uh, maybe chapter 8. I'm not sure which, which chapter. But the point is, some believe that they would be raised in the netherworld. And others believe that they would be brought back to this world and then uh, restored back to the land. Jesus nor Paul believed either of those concepts. Uh, they believed that Israel would be restored to land, but they were looking for the heavenly country that Abraham was looking for, and that was a, a, a city that was built by God. Now, in terms of what they believed, in uh, Matthew 22 and also in Mark 12, the Sadducees come to him with a question that they had been stumping the Pharisees with, and that was about the, uh, the man uh, and the woman, who, the man who died, the woman who had seven husbands, and uh, he, so he says, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Israel was a polygamous society. And however, polyandry was forbidden. So what they did was they raised the question from Deuteronomy 25.5 that had to do with the levered marriage law because they prefaced their question with Moses said, and they were saying that if she comes back, she's got seven husbands, that's a violation of Torah. And the Pharisees couldn't answer that because they had a physical concept of resurrection. That's the problem with the physical resurrection. Jesus said in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are as the angels. They cannot die anymore because they are the sons of God being the sons of the resurrection. Now, so what he was saying is that's not the end of marriage per se. What he was saying is in the kingdom, you do not produce children like you had to produce them under the law, which means that you had to bring a child into the covenant through procreation, which implied marriage, not fornication. And uh, in the kingdom of God, a child of God is produced by faith. That's why Galatians 3, 26 through 29 says, you're all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have, as has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, but you're all one in Christ. And if you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's the difference. Sure. <clears throat> All right. In Job 19 and 25, just give me a, a moment to get to the text so I will read it and not, um, not have quoted. Uh, yeah, he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at the last on the earth. Now, that text just simply says that the Redeemer would stand at the last on the earth. Well, Christ did stand in the last days on the earth. It did not say that he was going to uh, stand at the end. We are, I've already quoted that Christ appeared in the last days. He spoke in the last days, taught in the last days, died in the last days to put away sin in the last days. However, and that that uh, uh, supports or establishes the fact that yes, his Redeemer did stand on the earth in the last days. But the other part of the text says this, and after my skin is destroyed, 
This I know that in my flesh I shall see God. Now, if you studied this text, Zadok, you know, and even in the marginal reference, it says, after my skin is struck off, I will see God. Study Kyle and DeLitch. You can go to Bible Hub and look at all of the uh, references to this passage, and you will see that they all say it is out of his flesh that he would see God. So Job is not affirming or stating or asserting that he's going to have a physical resurrection and see God uh, in his flesh. That's one view uh, that the scholars recognize. And then the second view is Job, because of the Hebraic view of a uh, very adverse situation where even if they were in a terminal illness, they would view that as death. It's the idea of Job being restored in his flesh back to uh, a state of wealth with his children, et cetera, that you see in the end of the book. That qualifies for what the Hebrew scriptures would suggest as a resurrection. You can also see the same thing with Hezekiah in Isaiah 38. All right, and Zadok, be sure and turn your mic back on. Whenever you're speaking, make sure you turn it back on on Zoom. Yeah, wherever you turned it off, because they say they can't hear you. Okay, yeah, always turn it on when you're speaking. That's because you didn't. Okay, hey, I appreciate it. All right, let me set the time real quick. Yes. Hold on. All right, who are you? Hey, so brothers and sisters, I appreciate you all once again, man. Salute to the Grand Rising family, the Creative Real uh, uh, Realties family, uh, um, or Realities family. Um, also, for those of you who are listening in on the Bible Dojo, salute to you and salute to everybody listening in through our brother William Bell on uh, YouTube tonight as well. Y'all finally see somebody give him the business that he deserves because this four preterism view is a new view. It's a view that's not that old. And I like it. It's interesting, but it's as bad as a lot of other doctors. It's as bad as Gnosticism. It's as bad as <laughs> it's as bad as the uh, hypostasis of the archons. It's as bad as the apocryphon of John. It's as bad as some of the works of, uh, 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 of Valentinus and Marcion and them boys in their day because they denied the literal resurrection of the body as well. So what I'm going to tell you all is what I have undeni uh, undeniably proven tonight is that Brother William Bell, while he is pointing out some things that in part I might agree with, with the narrative of, uh, 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 of being dead in our sins and, and when the spirit of God is given to us, we are made alive. So that's a type of resurrection. But brothers and sisters, you all know clearly that it was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that the children of Israel literally believed in the resurrection from the dead. And also Christ believed in it. He is the first to come from the dead. And afterward, Christ will bring all of those who the father give him the power to bring back from the dead. He shall he said he shall raise them from the dead and bring with him as well. What's interesting is, is that for everyone who is listening today, this doctrine is similar to the Jehovah Witness doctrine of, uh, uh, of Christ reigning in the heavens and that there is something that has happened, but yet we have not seen it overtake the earth. You do not see the believers in Christ having any rule and dominion over the planet. You do not see righteousness covering the earth as the water covered the seeds, according to the prophets, 70 AD ain't established nothing like that. From that time till now, our full preterist brothers have no clue what it means for righteousness to cover the entire globe, like the water covered the seas, for the nations to put down their weapons of war and to turn their once war budgets into agricultural budgets, or as it says in the prophets, they shall turn their swords and their spears into plowshares and pruning hooks, and the nations of the earth will not practice war 
anymore. 70 AD ain't accomplished that yet. So guess what? There, he would have to admit that it's still some stuff he ain't even waiting to see. This kingdom that's been in control for 2,000 years now with these resurrected saints in their heart ain't produced a result yet. But hey, check this out. I also proved today that John, the revelator, by early believers who followed their doctrine, even those who wrote about him, literally talked about him being put on Patmos during the reign of Domitian and let go at the end of Domitian's reign. John becoming that first uh, of becoming that bishop in Ephesus when he gave the church the message is estimated to be over 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. So when you read the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is covering some things that already happened and things that are still to come. And just like them seven churches were warned of their evil and that there was still a reward that was coming, brothers and sisters, let us rest in that hope. Let us rest in that hope. Let us go run from our evil. Let us, like Paul said, die daily. Or as Polly Carpenter said, uh, 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 we see the resurrection seasonally, but there yet remains a future resurrection for the dead. And I wanted to make that point as well. I also proved by abundant evidence by about six or seven witnesses that within the first 100 years of John having that vision on Patmos, a couple of his direct students, let alone a few others, I would at least say they kind of may have had an idea. They thought they knew what they was talking about. Polycarp thought he knew what he was talking about from his direct teacher. And then his direct student, Irenaeus, also thought he knew what his teacher taught him from his teacher, John. And that was that they were still waiting for a resurrection and they were telling their generations that they ought to turn from their sins and rest in the hope of that which is still to come of the resurrection of the dead. Brothers and sisters, our four preterist brothers are correct in my opinion when they talk about the end of Israel's covenant age, but there was also something that is left to mankind. And as, and as I showed in that Acts chapter 17, that God was going to judge the inhabitable world by his son, Jesus the Christ. And so with that, we know that what? We know that as Peter said, the first world that existed was overflowed by water. And this world is reserved unto fire and judgment. Brothers and sisters, that is the world of mankind. And there is a judgment still to come. Oh, and last but not least, Remember in Revelation 20 when it said, I saw that great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the, uh, the heaven and the earth had fled away and there was no more place found for them. I'm, I was trying to go to the text, but when I, but my, uh, my actual uh, Bible app is still buffering at this moment. That reminds me, it actually says that the earth and the sea were going to give up the dead in it and that they saw all both small and great stand before the throne to be judged and the books were opened. All small and great, brothers and sisters, if that haven't happened in 70 CE, we weren't a part of it. Not only did the saints of the first resurrection get their portion, but the rest of the dead who were judged after the thousand years, because you know the end of the thousand years is 72 somehow in his eschatology. Brothers and sisters, all the dead were judged by the things written in the book, but none of us were even born. So maybe this judgment is, is an everlasting judgment. And, you know, we when we born, we live and die. And I, I don't get their eschatology. They have no understanding of the book of Revelation. And they piss poor on the prophets, in my opinion. But they have a little bit that some people should pay attention to. But they are falling short when they have nothing to back this doctrine until about, what, about 500 years ago or so when this thing came up? you know, coming up out of Rome and then permeating America and, and, and the rest of Europe. So I'll end here. My name is Zay Dr. God Hopham C. They also call me Cream Corn because I'm running things. I would ask y'all to subscribe to my channel on YouTube, The Bible Dojo, where you can continue to follow me. Uh, yes, I can. Are we ready? Okay. All right. Uh, I want to thank Zadok for uh, participating in the discussion. Also, want to thank the audience as well. Now, he just admitted that 
the last days was the end of Israel's old covenant age. Well, if that's the case, then all of those things that I mentioned in my first affirmative were to happen in Israel's last days because Daniel said 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. And he listed everything, including the uh, coming in of everlasting righteousness, the sealing up of vision and prophecy, said there's no further prophecy uh, beyond that. And by the way, he quoted Tertullian. Tertullian even stated, even though these, these uh, so-called fathers, they contradict themselves everywhere, and I've got their contradictions, even Irenaeus's and all the rest of them. I got them right here in front of me. Um, just didn't want to waste time dealing with them. But even Tertullian said, this is when the advent of Christ was fulfilled. And he quotes Daniel 7, gives all the reigns of the kings, and says in the time of Vespasian, that's when the advent was fulfilled, when vision and prophecy was, set, was sealed up. Chris, Chrysostom, John Chrysostom, also said that we know that Christ ought to have come because the gifts ceased long ago. So uh, he wants to talk about these guys. They're all over the place with their eschatology. But anyway, I don't want to spend any more time on that. Now, he also uh, admitted that Acts 17 was the judgment of the Orchomene. Well, that's the same world that the apostles were told to go into all the Orchomene and preach the gospel to all the nations. And I've affirmed and shown where all that was done prior to 70 AD. And Jesus said, when that happened, then the end would come. Acts 17 said it was an appointed day. Who preached it? The same apostles in the same Orchomene with the same message, the gospel of righteousness, and told them to repent for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. That's the same gospel message. Zadok is trying to tell you that's a whole different thing. You see, he's got to take it outside of that old covenant age in order to make his doctrine fit. And he labored and somersaulted over that all night long and tried to dodge it, but he just couldn't do it. And by the way, uh, again, when you look in Galatians 5.5, 5, he says, we through the spirit do wait for the hope of righteousness. There's only one hope in the Bible. It's the hope of righteousness. Now, I'd like to see a physical body become righteousness. No, righteousness is justification from sin. And that was their hope. He didn't find a hope of a physical body coming out of the ground. Uh, in addition, uh, he tried Deuteronomy 32. We showed him that Deuteronomy 32 was the last days. That's what Peter was quoting in 2 Peter. And it's also what he, uh, the writer was quoting in Hebrews 10 and verse 30, saying that the Lord would judge his people. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. But in verse 37, he says, and he who is coming will come in a very, very little while. Hebrews 10 and verse 37. So all these passages referring to at hand. He tried to wiggle his way out of Philippians chapter 3 with Paul, who said he had not attained to the ex anastation the resurrection out from among the dead. Paul wasn't physically dead, yet he was attaining to the resurrection because he was a part of the first fruits that began on Pentecost. Even though Paul wasn't on Pentecost, he was a part of that group. And that's why James said, of his own will, he brought us forth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Look, the first fruits can only be the first century believers. They can't be 21st century believers. And they were a pledge of the coming harvest that was at the end of the age. He denied that was 70 AD, but then he said it was the old covenant, the end of the old covenant age. He's contradicting himself all over the place. Uh, he wanted to talk about Justin Martyr. Well, uh, Justin Martyr uh, denies a lot of things that he said and even took Matthew 24, which Zadok says was fulfilled in 70 AD. Zadok took that and applied it to, um, uh, or rather Justin Martyr took it and applied it to events happening in his day. Also, something else that Justin Martyr said that was really interesting, uh, he said that there were many pious and faithful Christians who believed that when you die, you go to heaven. That's a preterist view. That's long before 500 years that he was talking about. He said there were people in his day. Now, they're just as close to the apostles as was Justin Martyr, and they were saying that when you die, you leave this body behind, and you don't take it with you. That means they weren't believing in the, in the physical resurrection from the dead, but I guess he missed that in, in Justin, uh, Justin Martyr. Also, uh, when we talked about the death of Christ, the Bible says the death that he died, Romans 6 and verse 10, he died to sin. Yes, Christ died in a physical body, but we have to understand the purpose of his death was for putting away sin. And that's the focus of 1 Corinthians 15. We cited Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1. We also cited Hosea chapter 13, all of which had to do 
with raising them out of captivity, which was uh, the um, uh, basically the symbolism, if you please, or the type of the antitype, which was about taking them out of the true bondage. When Jesus came to the Jews, uh, spoke to the Jews in John 8, and he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They said, well, will Abraham see? We've never been in bondage to any man. Jesus said, whoever commits sin is the bond servant of sin. He was trying to get them out of the dust of the real captivity, and that was the bondage of sin, and that's why death reigned from Adam to Moses, but when Christ came, grace reigns, and therefore we're no longer under it. Zadok said that we don't have righteousness in all the earth. Well, what did the apostles do? They failed their mission because they preached the gospel to all the world. That means righteousness was spread in all the world. That's Colossians 1.5. The gospel has come to you as it has in all the world. That's righteousness in all the cosmos, Zadok. You just said it didn't happen. That is a bald face. You know what? Anyway, um, in uh, Matthew or first John, he cited that text. Look, John said it has not yet appeared. Well, they couldn't have been talking about the physical appearance of Christ because in first John chapter one, he says, we have touched him. We've seen him. We've handled him. We have heard with our, et cetera, all of the word of life. And then he's going to go to chapter three and contradict that and say that Christ is supposed to come back in a physical body. That again, contradicts John. Furthermore, John talked about things that were in the last hour in that particular time. I cited Romans 13. 11 and 12 for the last hour. And we also used Isaiah 49 to say that the acceptable time, the Jubilee was in their day. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So the resurrection out of sin death occurred at the end of the age. Now I can't hear, I don't know if my time is up or what. Three seconds. Goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you. And I appreciate your attention.
there's no audio now because they're calculating um, or tallying up the winner, which I'm not concerned about at all. My only concern is that truth is taught and um, the number of people that are going to respond uh, in a positive way to this message after this debate is over. I want to thank you too, Manny. I appreciate you. I uh, appreciate the level of professionalism you bring to the room. And to all the audience, uh, we appreciate you listening uh, via Berean. Don't just uh, go by what you brought to the table, but go back and search the things to see whether they are so. And I think uh, if you do that, you know, you will come out on the side of the truth. Uh, because that's what we're all about here. Um, so thanks to the moderators, uh, thanks to the timekeepers as well, and uh, just appreciate the opportunity to do this. Um, not enough time to cover a vast subject as the resurrection and uh, to keep the focus, but nevertheless, you know, this, it is what it is, and now it's down in history, and we'll let it stand as it stands. So once again, thank you very much. Pretty sure everybody in the audience uh, knows that if they like to do it, they can do it. Well, I guess that's it. Um, I'm going to close this room out for a minute. And uh, unless you guys had any uh, any questions you want to throw at me, I will. Um, I'll maybe take notes on them. You can put them here, and then I will. Um, maybe I'll make some videos on them uh, later on. So if you want to just line up a few questions, I'll try to copy them out and uh, maybe do some videos. I got a lot of information to present as a result of this moving forward. <laughs>
But thank you all for joining in. I apologize for the technical difficulties. I knew that there were going to be some uh, because, you know, we're trying to operate with, I think, four different platforms. He has a YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. And um, we were on Clubhouse, which is an audio channel on our phones. Um, and then I'm on Zoom. So, you know, with all of that going, trying to keep mics on and off and avoid the disturbances and, and everything, it, it was just a, a real challenge. And um, I wish we could have done it live. That would have eliminated a lot of that in, in some ways, but that's okay. Uh, it is what it is. All right, well, with that, um, thanks again for everyone being here. Um, just kind of look and see what took place. And Brother Hopkins, if you're still on, it's good to hear from you. I meant to say something to you earlier, but I certainly appreciate uh, your being here. And um, hello, Shana. And let's see, I know there are a lot of people on here. If I start calling names, um, it'll just, um, I'll leave somebody out. So I'm gonna leave it at that. All right, well, I'm gonna get out of here, um, take a little bit of a break and we'll let it be. Now, how do I do that? <laughs> I think the first thing I do is go to Zoom and just end it there. Stop this.